Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Come on down to the lawn and let's get together here. Uh, I'm Cal Mukamoto. I'm the state forester for Oregon. And I want to thank uh, thanks to everyone who's out here today, guest speakers, Central Oregon community members and elected officials, federal, state, and local partners. And I also wanted to give a big thank you uh, to the team of ODF folks who made this event happen from our Salem headquarters, our Eastern Oregon area, and Central Oregon district. Uh, they put a lot of time in this over the last few months and, and thought to this tour. And we're on a tour, guys. We're outside, yeah. Okay, but so today's tour takes a look at the cycle of fire through the lens of how it impacts communities. And this is where I'm going to go off script. Okay, Hillary, don't, yeah, I'm going off script. Uh, <laughs> you know, when the Aubrey Hall fire happened, and uh, I was, what, what year was that? Who can tell me? Yeah, I was driving from Portland to Central Oregon. I was going to go look at some logging in Central Oregon. And I heard on the radio, hey, this fire. And I have a friend that lives in Sunrise Village. And I went, that's headed right towards his house. Well, this guy is a forester, worked for the Forest Service. And to much of the homeowners' dismay, homeowners' association dismay, he was out secretly thinning his property. And uh, so I called his house, and the answering machine came on. And I went, oh, he's alive. <laughs> you know? I mean, he figured he, he probably got evacuated, and he was alive. When we were able to come back and look at his house, the fire went around his house. And so after that, the people who didn't lose their homes in that fire, you heard a lot of chainsaws going on, you know, thinning going on and stuff. But from those days, from way back then to today, the attitude has totally changed. There's a realization that we have a fire problem. I mean, of course, since 2013, we've been experiencing major fire issues. But to go around and look on this tour today, you're going to see some real progress being made. Thinnings, you're going to see uh, people taking this thing seriously. Uh, you know, I want to make a call out to Phil Chang. Phil, are you here? There he is. And back in the 90s, you know, I was around banging the drum on thinning and so on and so, so forth. But I was also thinking that we could develop a bioenergy community here and, uh, you know, to help bring that material out. But Phil was working for COIC, Scott Acock, and you were trying to do a lot of collaboration in the Central Oregon. And to see where it started in those days from the 90s to where we are today we have made progress. It's amazing. So that's what I'm going to end up with here, is that uh, communities across Oregon are dealing with this issue, across the United States. And, you know, we are all trying to get to a better spot. And that's what the, I hope that you can see some of the results of all that effort from all the people at ODF, Forest Service, BLM. I mean, all the agencies, all the community folks, fire departments, law enforcement, everybody involved with fire protection, uh, I really we have to. I just want to extend a thank you and enjoy the tour today. So who's next? Jim. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jim Kelly, uh, chair of the Board of Forestry. And I guess what I don't understand. I'm you know, supposed to be a forestry tour and standing in front of a golf course, <laughs> and uh, this all seems. This is going to be very civilized, I think, and I, what I don't understand is why we, you know, this being Ben, why are we not doing this tour on mountain bikes? You know, what are we doing getting in vehicles? Anyhow, um, I do want to mention that, you know, I've got a personal connection here in that uh, my wife and I bought a house um, as a second home uh, on Aubrey Butte and uh, have had that for the last 10 years. And I've always been struck... Um, really because we had a friend who was a home builder for many years in the Berkeley Hills down in California. And uh, so I was familiar with those hillside, that hillside. And, um, and when the fire hit there, three of the homes that he had built during his career uh, burned up. And, and then I arrive in Aubrey Butte, and I just look around and think, this looks exactly, exactly like the Berkeley Hills. This area is really vulnerable. And then as I've been here and I've, I've learned about, you know, what a really a tremendous amount of work has been happening around this city and, and in this area to make those neighborhoods more fire safe. But it's also really clear to me that um, a lot of work has to continue to happen by homeowners in those areas to make their, their homes uh, more fire safe. And I know the Bend Fire Department has a, uh, a program where they come out and uh, uh, consult with homeowners and 
think that's a great thing. Anyhow, uh, looking forward to this. Uh, I guess I'll be getting in the car. Uh, Should have brought my mountain bike, but <laughs> who's next? Ryan. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Morning, folks. I'm Brian Pugh. I'm the area director for Eastern Oregon. How much cord do we got? It. They're all standing in the back. I'll come closer. Um, so really appreciate being here today in Bend, in Deschutes County, hosting the tour, the speakers that we've got. As we all know, with things with COVID, we planned the tour three times. Now we actually get to hold it. So we had many, uh, many delays there, but it's good to see you all. When we think about ODF uh, in Eastern Oregon, we picked today to be in Bend. We could pick any spot in central eastern Oregon and have these same conversations with communities there. And it's really the communities and our partners that really make us successful. And so if we think about going from the Dalles to Klamath Falls all the way over to Lalala, we could be John Day in between and many other towns. We could be in any of those settings and having those same conversations. And so as we think about that today, we really need your input and your ideas to work with us and work with our other partners to solve some of these bigger problems on the fuels reductions, on the emergency response, on working together. And the last thing I'll think about is um, we've got firefighters right now. ODF has firefighters in New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas. And so by no means is it an Eastern Oregon area issue that we're working with or an Oregon issue. It's, it's a West-wide thing. And our folks are down there now as it's raining here, and we know we're going to call on those folks to come up, and they do every summer to help us fight fire up here. And so it's not just the people standing around here today. It, it is a wide, wide net that uh, helps be a part of the solution there. So as we're having uh, talks and discussions today, really want to hear from you all. Sure, we've got some speakers queued up, and, and they'll start some discussions off, but we want to hear from you all too, and we know you've got a lot of local knowledge. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan Gordon. Ryan's got a couple logistical things there, and then we'll uh, go about our day. Thank you, and again, welcome, everybody. Uh, yeah, just a few logistical issues. Uh, the setup for today is that we've got four stops planned. We've got about an hour at each of those stops. You've seen that on the agenda. Uh, we do have an hour and a half planned for lunch. Um, so at each of those stops, including this one, we've got roughly 30 minutes or so panel discussion. Uh, we've got invited guest speakers who hopefully will keep their comments around seven minutes or so each. Um, and then we'll have about 30 minutes for uh, Q&A and discussion. And as Brian said, we really want to encourage uh, a lot of dialogue here. Um, it's my job to keep us on time and on track today. So um, I'll be doing my best to make sure that we get out of here uh, at the appointed time, which I think is uh, 1030 for this stop. We do have uh, kind of a buffer in between for travel time um, for folks to get back to the vans. Also use restrooms. There are restrooms available, I think, at all of the stops, including the last one. I believe we have an, uh, some porta potties that have been delivered. If you need the restroom here, uh, it's through the door at the back of this uh, building right here. Um, just make sure that I am not missing anything. I think that's it. Uh, if you have any uh, logistical questions, please direct them towards Terry Free. He's raising his hand right here. And uh, just looking forward to the day. So I think with that, we'll kick off the agenda. And I'm looking at Mike Shaw. I think he's up. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Shaw. I currently serve as the Chief of Fire Protection for the Oregon Department of Forestry. Great comments from Cal and Jim and, and Brian to kick this off. It's, uh, it actually really is kind of humbling to be here uh, after a couple years of COVID and, and not being able to have in-person meetings. And so uh, it's really great to not only have the meeting uh, yesterday, but uh, a tour today and be able to stand here and talk about some of the, the challenges that are facing the Board of Forestry, the agency, and really the state of Oregon. So. Just for context, uh, you've heard it, uh, Phil Chang said it, we are standing in the scar of the Aubrey Hall fire from 1990, and this was chosen for a variety of reasons. Um, one, um, from my perspective, as we talk about the challenges we have and look to the future, a lot of times it's good to look back at the past and look at where we've come from. And so this fire was, uh, is 30 years old. And what came out of this fire uh, the results of this fire have got us to where we are today with things like 
uh, terms like wildland urban interface, defensible space, uh, how we respond to fires with interagency response, Forest Service, BLM, County Sheriff, uh, rural and city fire departments, ODF, you name it. Uh, that response and many of those outcomes have come out of fires like this in the past and the lessons that we've learned. So a couple stats on the Aubrey Hall fire. The point of origin was somewhere out, out here to the north and it was a wind driven fire in August of 1990. It was really significant because it burned uh, 22 homes and 3,500 acres in about 10 hours. And you can imagine as you try to do uh, emergency response and evacuation and you're a sheriff's office, you imagine if you're the Forest Service, the BLM, ODF, Bend Fire, what it's like to try and respond to a fire like that in that short a time frame. And we continue to see these sorts of fires evolve year after year after year. We saw it in 2020 in a variety of places, not here, but across, across the, the Cascades. And so it's important that we learn from this. And so today, as we go through the day at the four stops, we're going to look at kind of the suppression and how we've evolved with our suppression efforts with interagency response. Um, we're going to look at some of the mitigation measures that have been done. There's going to be some discussion on land use planning and how that has evolved. And some of the, the evolution of land use planning is evident in, in the fire scar here. Um, and so it's super important to look at how we've evolved. And then as we look and talk about climate change, continued uh, challenges with, with uh, fuel conditions and weather conditions that challenge us with these really catastrophic fires, how do we take that next step? So a couple of really important things that have occurred recently, the passage of Senate Bill 762 for the Oregon Department of Forestry at a statewide level. Uh, Oregon State Fire Marshal, I think I saw Claire, there, Claire, thanks, um, and a variety of other state entities that have benefited through that uh, legislation last year was really a great first step. And we're going to talk about some of the uh, mitigation efforts that are occurring with the money that came through that. Um, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act on the federal side of the equation is looking at the exact same issues that the state is looking at. And those efforts are being put in place here locally. So thanks, Holly and Kevin and, and others from the Forest Service that are here. Um, I think the last thing that I want to say before I turn it over to Gordon, and he's going to talk a little bit about the interagency response and how we've evolved over time in these areas. I think it's really important for the board to know, and we've been talking about this a long time, but the passage of Senate Bill 762, the Infrastructure Act on the federal side, those are really important steps and they're great. They don't solve the problem. What's really important to know is that we need to continue to make um, sustained efforts in time and money to continue to work on this problem. The problem that we are facing today has come about over a hundred years of uh, management activities on forest lands, suppression activity, uh, regarding f uh, wildland fuels, and we can't get out of that in a one-year or a five-year time horizon. It's going to take long, sustained efforts, and it's important for all of us to talk about that and be honest about what the real issues are so that we can get downstream 5, 10, and 20 years. So with that, Gordon, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Mike. Um, so uh, just for introduction's sake, uh, my name is Gordon Foster. I am uh, currently the Assistant District Forester for Central Oregon District. Normally, uh, my, my day job is the Prineville Sisters Unit Forester. So um, the, some, of the, some of the land you see here um, uh, that's private forest land uh, is actually what, what we protect for the unit in Central Oregon District. Um, Currently, you know, right now we have uh, 10 engines on the unit, a dozer, and one five-person hand crew. So that's kind of our makeup. Uh, we respond to the, to the private forest lands, uh, some urban interface, um, and, and whatnot. So, um, you know, I guess to kind of start off, uh, you know, I think going back and looking at Aubrey Hall and the response uh, that we had back then and what it looks like uh, now. So... You know, back back in 1990, um, there were I think there were actually two dispatch centers uh, that were located here. 
one on the Deschutes and then one uh, for ODF in the Ochico National Forest. So uh, our ODF resources at that time were actually dispatched out of Prineville, which is a totally different story uh, than what we see today. Um, you know, I think uh, the thing is, you know, just kind of, kind of imagining that when you have two dispatch centers plus a 911 center sending rural fire department resources to the Shevlin Park start. Um, a lot of communication had to go between all those different centers at that time, which, you know, takes a lot of time. Um, I was reading an article uh, that was written 20, or about 10 years ago on the 20 year anniversary of Robbie Hall um, and how long, and there was a, there was a quote in there uh, from a gentleman saying that, you know, he called 911 and it took forever for him to hear sirens for the response to the fire. So this fire actually burned across three major roadways across the Deschutes River and jumped over into Deschutes River Woods, which is a fairly large community on the south side of the river. Um, so it's pretty, pretty significant fire growth in, in that 10 hour period. So all those resources coming in from the fire department, ODF, Forest Service, um, was, was uh, probably very chaotic at the time. Um, you know, during, in the 90s, and I, I think back on my career in the 90s, I think we only had probably a couple radio frequencies per, per agency, um, and, and communication was very critical. Um, we couldn't really talk to each other because we all had different frequencies, and then uh, to bring in evacuations with that um, was, was kind, of, uh, kind of a chaotic time. So, you know, I, I think if, as you look at, out at the landscape here, um, you know, the Forest Service boundary is over there at the Timberline. Um, during, during this time, this, this whole area was actually part of the Miller Tree Farm, uh, which was primarily industrial forest land. So now it's changed quite significantly. Uh, we did have homes uh, in the city of Bend, uh, and that was primary response of the city uh, during that time. Um, so with the urban growth that we've seen um, encroaching into the urban interface uh, makes things uh, way different. So now, you know, I kind of jump back to 2022 and what we do now uh, is, is, is significantly changed over time with partnerships, planning, um, you know, currently uh, we're actually, uh, we have meetings all year long. Uh, with Central Oregon Fire Chiefs Association, which is made up of uh, 12 fire departments, ODF, the Forest Service. Um, we have uh, one interagency communication center now, which is out of Redmond, CUIDC, uh, that the Forest Service, the BLM, and ODF are dispatched out of, and then working closely with the 911 centers uh, within, within Deschutes County. So those, those communication, now, now communication is way easier um, currently, we respond closest resources, which means it doesn't matter what color the truck is. You know, we may be the primary protection agency per, for private lands or private forest lands, but a Forest Service engine down on Scott Street could get there faster than an engine out of Sisters or an engine out of Lapine. So we, we don't care what color it is, red, green, yellow, white. Um, get the resource there as fast as we can and respond as quick as we can. So it's, you know, it's critical, uh, especially in the interface and then for our natural resources, you know, our, our mission as ODF, minimize acres. Um, so make the fires as small as we can. So, you know, I think um, with all that, you know, I think the cooperation and the meetings that we have currently uh, between all agencies, uh, you know, if it's for response, or for, um, you know, fuels mitigation, restoration work. Uh, we work really closely together. I kind of joke to folks uh, that, that uh, I go to a lot of meetings where I see the same faces, and sometimes I go to meetings I don't see all the same faces because we're a fairly small, small piece of that. And there's only one of me, and maybe, you know, the Forest Service has five or six guys that can, can you know, go to those meetings for us. But appreciate you all being here. Welcome to the Prineville Sisters Unit of Central Oregon District. And I'm gonna pass it off to Chief Todd Riley from Ben Fire to talk a little about his perspective.
Good morning. Uh, like Gordon said, Todd Riley, Fire Chief, Ben Fire and Rescue. I also have my Operations Chief, Bill Boos. Where did he go? Oh, there he is. My, yeah, he's my salty professional. Um, again, we're thankful and grateful to work in a community that has the system that Gordon just described. When there's smoke in the air, we all go and then figure out who's responsible for it later. And we're unique in that sense. And I think if you're standing here today, you understand that. Um, our community has changed. I mean, you can look around us right now and understand that it hasn't been like this for, for very long. The edge of our town used to be way over there. Now it's over here. And so as the urban growth boundary keeps getting pushed into the interface, and again, our community depends on growth to survive. There's two, two places you can go, out or up. Bend is doing both. And so the municipal fire department that also protects the surrounding rural district, we do have some challenges, which is why we are so grateful for the partnerships that we have here. Um, we're challenged as a city fire department that also provides EMS services, structural firefighting. When that smoke call comes in, we're not always available. And so that's the paradox. When I was this engine captain right here at the West Station several years ago, we got dispatched to an ambulance call. We're driving there. I see smoke on the west side of town. By the time we transported, took the patient to the hospital, got back to the fire station, two bulls was off and going. I have some amazing pictures from the balcony of the fire station that would have been closest to that fire, but we didn't go. Again, because we were tied up on an ambulance call. So that is our very real challenge. We run, just last year we ran 12,000 calls between four engines and three ambulances. Our reliability is not guaranteed, which again, you can find yourselves at a call in the city handling our fire, and we are deeply appreciative of that. Legislation like Senate Bill 762 is essential at the local level to impact uh, the lives of our community members. Um, so it's really my job to translate what's happening on at the state level to how it can impact us on a local level. So my elected officials, my city council, and my rural fire board, they look to us and say, like, okay, how is Senate Bill 762 really going to impact us here? Um, and so Again, I'm grateful to work for a community that is progressive. We're already doing a lot of the things that are being um, stated in Senate Bill 762. We have a community that's deeply engaged and they want their homes to be protected. Conversely, they don't really like smoke in the air, which makes a smoke management plan and prescribed fires a challenge. And so we're educators. Chief Boos and I, we educate the community all the time. Smoke in the air in the spring and in the fall is better than smoke in the air in the summer, and here's why. And that message never, ever gets old, and I think that's where we stand to do our job for sure um, with educating our community because that's what prevents these devastating fires from coming through. Um, happy to be part of this today and looking forward to the question and answer. Again, that's why I brought Chief Boos out because he's got the experience. So I don't know who I'm passing it off to next. Sergeant Garibay, nice to see you. Thanks, Chief. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Nathan Garibay. I'm a sergeant here at the Deschutes County Sheriff's Office. Welcome to Deschutes County and Bend. Uh, my day job is I'm the emergency services manager, so that really means that I oversee and coordinate our emergency management program here in Deschutes County. So in Deschutes County, emergency management is contained within the Sheriff's Office. And so that's great for me because I get to wear a couple hats uh, throughout the year. And uh, Today, I'm just going to give you just a little bit of insight into how our organization and agency tries to respond to wildland fire and to support our, our fire agencies and other community partners uh, in, in this. You know, we, uh, we do a lot of work around preparedness, mitigation, and response to all hazards, but obviously uh, in this neck of the woods, wildfire is a pretty common and, and important uh, hazard that we pay close attention to. I'd also just like to point out kind of th this is something that goes on year round. If you haven't noticed, uh, these meetings, you know, I would consider not only our organizations as, as key stakeholders with each other, but friendships. And those develop over time uh, in, in planning opportunity or planning projects and mitigation projects and response to emergencies. And those bonds and friendships and, and trust that we develop 
uh, is critical in our ability to effectively respond. So, uh, you know, the sheriff's office is primarily respond, uh, responsible for evacuation as it relates to wildfire. A uh, very complex and dynamic uh, challenge that we face. Uh, our community members are incredibly supportive. We, we are very blessed here that our, our community members support us and, and I think we have great trust with them and we try really hard to do that. That's, a, that's kind of a, a key component of our office. Uh, but you know, those, those challenges, uh, you know, if you mentioned uh, Gordon and, and Mike talked about Aubrey Hall, you know, that was uh, 3,000 acres in one burn period. I'm, I've, I've uh, chatted with one of the incident commanders of that fire, and I think if I remember right, he described that fire as a fist fight. And uh, that, that is the reality that we can face each, each summer and sometimes even late spring or early fall anymore. Um, and and those, those decisions have to be made quickly. They need to be uh, made uh, in collaboration. So, you know, our office and, and you know, we take, uh, we take the input from our, our fire professionals, our fire managers, uh, a number of you are in the, in the audience today. And, you know, we make those recommendations to the sheriff as far as what an appropriate evacuation would be. And then we implement that. And that's, that can be the challenge, uh, whether that's using our uh, emergency alert systems, our... Um, door-to-door, -door, uh, broadcast media, social media, all the tools we have at our disposal, and then coordinating some degree of traffic management program in, in response to that. Uh, you can't always plan all the parameters of what an evacuation would look like because you just don't know what, uh, where it's going to start. You don't know what the conditions are going to be that day, and so we have to have plans and, and processes that are, are well-defined, uh, well-exercised, but flexible enough to be able to respond to that. I would also like to um, point out that um, Jody uh, from Oregon Living with Fire, I think that's a key, that title of that program is really important is that we're living with fire, like rather than like, you know, this, this uh, fight with it, it's something that naturally occurs in our landscape. Uh, but Jody was a key uh, contributor over the years uh, to our Central Oregon Emergency Information Network, which is a group of uh, public information officers. Christy Shaw, too, a uh, big partner in that. Uh, and a number of, of our other public information officers because, you know, it's really important that we get the message out quickly, but we get it out right. And particularly when it, uh, you know, when you see smoke west of Bend, I mean, it blows up everybody's phone lines. It blows up. I mean, we've crashed Internet servers with our emergency maps because everybody wants to know what's going on. So having great folks like that that help us get that message out, get it out quickly and accurately um, is, is critically important. So I just would like to point that public information component cannot be understated. It seems like oftentimes the real, I shouldn't say the real emergency, we have the emergency and sometimes the second emergency is that public information crisis that happens as a result. So we really do feel blessed by having a great team, team members in that shop as well. So uh, with that, thank you for uh, letting us participate. I'm honored to be here. And uh, with that, I, Gordon, I give the mic back to you or? All right, thank you. So I guess uh, just uh, want to open it up to the group for any questions you may have uh, for, for the presenters. Uh, we'll maybe get Bill up here. Uh, Chief Riley will let him pat by. I think, I think Bill may have been here during Aubrey Hall. Uh, yeah. So I, I guess just open it up for questions. It's on. I have a question. Joe Justice, Board of Forestry. I'm, I'm just curious, one thing you didn't mention, which is different today than it was in the 90s, is severity resources, is the use of single-engine air tankers and et cetera. And as a landowner, those, I recognize the importance of that. I'm just curious, you know, the sheriff mentioned a fist fight. What would that fist fight have been if we would have had you know, single-engine air tankers on a, on, a, on a fire of this type? I know we're speculating, but I, I, I just want to just ask that question because that that's a that's a wonderful tool an incredibly effective tool um, to hit fires in August you know in, in times I would assume um, that you know that kind of resources would have been deployed in this kind of situation I'm guessing so I'll, I'll uh, do, let me let me take a stab at it uh, so I, I'm normally an operations section chief on an incident management team so I could probably answer uh, you know, I think uh, the, the severity resources that we have are, are critical now. Uh, I think probably back in the 90s, uh, we may have had one air tanker sitting in Red Redmond, may maybe. So our, our Redmond Air Center hosts uh, the federal uh, air, air tanker program. Uh, they host some of those aircraft. But 
they're not ever guaranteed to be there. Um, you know, we do currently on the unit have uh, two seats, uh, single engine air tankers that are out of out of Prineville. So they, I think those and the addition of our large air tanker program uh, definitely would have would have supported that uh, back in 1990. They support us now uh, pretty pretty he heavily. Um, you know, uh, the two bulls fire. Um, you know, I think it was critical to have those those resources. Um, uh, air tankers, at least we had, you know, air tankers sitting, sitting in Redmond at that time. Um, but I think the severity program, uh, definitely supports and, and helps us, uh, be more successful, uh, especially in the state and keeping those local. So, so it's been probably, I think the last time I was in Bend was in 2015 and uh, came in early and uh, visited some friends and just was astounded at the, um, at the increase in population. I think it's now 100,000. So my question is around the evacuation. And um, what probably is the biggest change from the Aubrey Fire to how you evacuate now? That's the first part of the question. And the second question, with what we can forecast with more expansive intensity, uh, um, and the um, you know the speed of fire. What is your thinking about evacuations for communities like this on what you still need to do? That's a great question. Uh, things that keep me up at night, basically, is what you're asking. <laughs> um, you know, I think compared to Aubrey Hall to today, one of the things that we I think are are um, in a better situation is I think we're better at getting good situational awareness quicker, more accurately, so we can make more timely decisions. Um, my dad was actually a deputy sheriff here in Deschutes County and was was one of the first ones on scene at Aubrey Hall and remembers when he pulled up on Shevlin Park Road, it was crossing, it was spotted and crossing, going across, heading south across Shevlin Park. Um, sometimes that fog of war, those initial uh, moments of a fire, initial you know, a couple hours are really hard to get your head wrapped around it, what it's doing, where it might go. Um, but I think the relationships that our agencies have together and, and the trust we have in one another to, to, to get that information and, and make some quick decisions is part of that. As far as where we need to go or where maybe where the technology and, and, um, and uh, things we can do to, to keep improving our evacuation is – yeah, there's technology out there that can we can predefine a few things. So possibly um, rather than having to you know kind of draw it on a you know grease paper, grease pencil and a map uh, on the hood of a pickup truck, maybe we can have some of the parameters predefined. You know if you can make say 75% of the decision, you know on a blue sky day, you know when there's smoke in the air, you just have to finish that last 25% to make that uh, a little quicker. Uh, really, probably where we need to go at some point is better integration with, you know, uh, as far as like when you look at some of the technology that ODOT is starting to employ on the highway system, as far as like smart intersections and some of those traffic management systems they're putting into place, how we can utilize those in evacuations. Um, you know, but that is a lot of time and money and expertise that often at the local level we we don't have and we're really blessed that our local public works folks are are really skookum smart folks but you know the a lot of that technology is something that's just is coming hopefully and and might be able to be better implemented um and then i think the other challenge is just you know we're seeing gosh are we 10 percent growth rate somewhere around there annually the last couple of years it feels like i don't know For some of us it feels like 30 percent growth rate but you know, I think that's constant educating people that are moving here that, you know, even if they've, they've come from like a fire prone area like California or other parts of the West, it's just a little different here, right? So keeping that messaging out there, keeping people educated, and then people forget. Uh, every time we have a big fire, everybody wants to know about, hey, what's the evacuation plan? Where do I uh, chip my, uh, get rid of my brush? You know, what do I do? You know, uh, but then after a time and we, they don't have an emergency you know, other priorities pop up on their in their life. And so it's that constant keeping that in front of people so that they're aware of what, what is going on. So I hope that answered your question. All right, thank you. I think it's Ben, right? Yeah. Thanks. 
um, Ben Doimling, uh, also on the Board of Forestry. Maybe we'll get to this in some later stops, but I'm just real curious how 762, and particularly the WUI rules and the fire map and those new regulations that we're writing and working on right now, how those might affect, like, I'm just looking at these houses here, will that change things? And if so, how? And uh, I guess I'm just really curious what that actually looks like out there. Um, that's a really good question. There's a whole lot of folks that are wanting to know what that looks like. Uh, at this point, we have, and you folks have uh, put forth the draft rules, and we went in front of the public with public hearings. Um, so we're going to come back with the with finalized rules. The challenge we've had is as we've worked with OSU to define to to draw that map, we haven't been able to look at what it looks like. We have some good senses of what it's going to be. What I would, and, and then once that's defined and the urban interface is set, then Oregon State Fire Marshal's office is going to work on what defensible space looks like and how that gets implemented. So it's a multi-step process. From my perspective, it, it's going to, and, and of course that's only going to occur on the high and extreme classifications that are tied to a risk class. And so I don't, it's going to encompass where the urban interface is, which is going to be a more comprehensive look statewide than we've ever had before. And with the state fire marshal and the capacity that they have, it's going to give us a better way to implement and educate and help landowners get to a better place on defensible space. Um, and so I think the end result is going to be great, but it, it, does, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not a whole lot different than Senate Bill 360, which was came out of fires like Aubrey Hall in 1996. It was a great educational tool, but, and it was, uh, somebody who said it, there's, so a lot of good work is done, but when other, it was Nathan, when other priorities come up in folks' life, then there's a maintenance component to those defensible space or uh, fuels reduction projects that come and all of a sudden 10 or 15 years have elapsed and we're back where we were because mother nature doesn't stop, right? And so there's going to be a huge component of the initial push for defensible space within the urban interface. And then there's, there's going to have to be continued education, as Nathan said, to keep it high on people's kind of priority list to maintain over time. These homes and what came out of Aubrey Hall in Deschutes County, and I can't speak to all the details, and I wish there was a few other folks here I didn't see uh, Ed Keith with Deschutes County, but Ed has been on the, on the forefront of a whole bunch of stuff that has happened in this area with the Miller Tree Farm and the land use planning that has gone in with home hardening and uh, vegetation management within these areas for development purposes. And that's another component of Senate Bill 762 within the urban interface. There's a component of har home hardening and land use that will come into play once that map is defined. So we don't know all of the results yet, but it's uh, we're getting close. Can I also just say yeah. there's the work that happens at the state level, there's the work with the so state fire marshal will we'll do, and then the implementation of these new defensible space requirements and these new um, wildfire resilient building material requirements. I guess just one follow-up to that. Um, I think your point is well taken. There's there's a burden um, on everybody, on, on the, the counties and the states and also on the landowners. And I guess maybe I'd be curious to hear from the some of the folks here. There's some some benefit, I'm assuming. That's the that's the point. Um, and maybe just some thoughts on the, the cost benefit for for you as, as managers and also for, for homeowners. Um. I mean, I, I, would, I would add to my earlier comments that it's gonna be a lot of work, that it's totally worth it. Um, you know, I was one commissioner uh, among a few who advocated uh, regularly and passionately for SB 762 
those the the defensible space requirements and the wildfire resilient building um, materials requirements that that are coming out of SB 762 are going to save a tremendous amount of property loss and suffering in this community over time and and that is um, the, the costs you know um, some of the greatest uh, opposition in in this community or concern um, came from uh, the, the building and development community about, you know, like these, these wildfire resilient building materials, this, is, this could cost us more. Uh, but when, when we get to the next stop, uh, Miller Tree Farm, I, I believe that Craig Letts is going to be there and he'll, he can actually share with you a little bit about how much, uh, how little uh, the additional costs actually were. So, Jody. <laughs> Um, and I'll tag on to that. Um, Jody Barron with Oregon Living with Fire. One of the gaps that we're seeing that we'll need help with at the local level is that implementation um, around affordability in some of our more vulnerable populations. Because as you'll see on today's tour, we're in a pretty affluent side of town. Um, and there are people that can afford to make those changes or implement things. And really, there it's a nominal cost and we know that. So how do we convey that to the folks on the east side of town where we had a skeleton fire, um, housing options that may be um, not as expensive and try to find that affordability piece or um, how do we retrofit some of our neighborhoods or some of our higher density neighborhoods or our multifamily dwellings, our mobile homes, um, things like that. So we're also trying to, um, as we're implementing some of the policies that are coming into play, um, making it accessible to more of our community than just um, that preconceived notion that only the rich can afford it. Who wants the mic next? <laughs> Open mic night. Good morning. I'm Claire McGrew from the Oregon Office of State Fire Marshal. Thank you, Mike, for the uh, connection earlier. I know we are all excited for that map to come out uh, in June. Um, and absolutely right on. We are working through the process of getting the Defensible Space Code um, through a review panel. So that's actually, uh, we had our first meeting yesterday for that. Um, and then just as a reminder, depart, uh, excuse me, uh, chapters 603, 604 is really, it's a very small, small section in the International Wui Code as well. All of that comes from model code language and it, it's founded in science and data, uh, which really to get back to the, the question that you had asked, does it make a difference? Is that going to make change? Um, and I would say that the answer is yes, right? It really is founded in, in again, data and science about where this comes from. Um, but it's bigger than just that. It's bigger than just the high and extreme risk across the state. This is a really great example where changes have been made already. Good homeowner connections, uh, local, state, federal agencies coming together for this. Really, it takes all of us in order to do it, but a huge push from members of the public as well. So we all have to invest in the solution. Um, and there is some good code language that will come to it from this primarily just for defensible space and then the maintenance of that. So I, I, I'll be around as well if there's additional questions. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Amanda Sullivan Astor. I'm with Associated Oregon Loggers. And so I just wanted to ask the panel of speakers, there was a lot of discussion around collaboration between local governments, uh, but what in this district and in this uh, uh, county is happening related to the industrial forest resources, be that from industrial forest lands um, and then also operations and, and operators uh, in this area. Uh, you know, I guess, uh, I guess to start off, and, and if I don't answer all your, the whole question, just let me know. Um, you know, our, our, in, our industrial land base uh, has changed over time. Um, you know, I think currently uh, we do have uh, Shanda Asset Management, which is just off to the, to the south or the north and uh, west here. Uh, that still manages uh, the timberlands. Uh, those those folks are are definitely involved in a lot of collaborative work, if not on the Deschutes Forest Collaborative, or you know even in some of our emergency response uh, conversations that go on. They they are involved. Uh, we try to bring those 
those landowners in um, early and often. Um, you know, we do have some additional, you know, Ponderosa land and cattle up in the sisters area that owns, owns property. Um, you know, I think it's very critical uh, with the number of fires we've had around here that's, that have impacted those, those landowners. Um, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge deal for them. Um, and to bring them in early and often is, is very critical. I guess the second piece, you know, our operators around here, uh, we, we struggle uh, with the implementation uh, or the funding we got from 762 and large landscape scale restoration or the landscape resiliency project program. Um, we're, you know, I, I was very concerned as a unit forester here that we would not have enough operators to get the work done. Um, so we're, you know, we're really pushing that industrial operator uh, even small operations doing fuel reduction, you know, there, there's a backlog of work. Um, you know, we definitely need more industrial operators, more just operators in general to do all the work that we need to do around here. Yeah, and I'll, just follow up. I'll just follow up and say, you know, we're, we're here to be a partner. Associated Oregon Loggers is. We have a new workforce development program. And so, uh, you know, we, we want to help you guys solve those problems as well. We'll, we'll call you up for the next meeting. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, thinking about the forest products industry in this region, you have to be aware of the history of sawmills and private industrial timberlands in this area. And, um, you know, the, the, to go way back, I mean, the, the Gilchrist family ran... Um, you know, wonderful private industrial uh, operations in in this region for you know, most of a century, and uh, when the, when that sawmill and those lands were sold to, to Crown Pacific um, in the in the 90s, uh, we saw what I would what I would say it was uh, unsustainable uh, levels of harvest on private industrial timberlands, and then uh, when when Crown went under and the, the the lands and the sawmill were were decoupled, so you've got a sawmill that does not have a private industrial timberland base of its own, and then the private industrial timberlands that are in this area were 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 logged pretty hard in in you know and not too not too long ago. And here on the east side of the mountains, forests don't grow very fast, so that leaves the that leaves the sawmill highly dependent on the public lands uh, timber base and the management of those lands is driven by um, uh, you know multiple concerns uh, wildfire being you know one of the greatest uh, uh, among them so um, it, I guess I would say here industry uh, you know has a has a place in in the management of the, you know, it, it, the need for the need for uh, volume has a place on the forest in and of itself, but it's also uh, very very tied together with the the, the process of restoration and the process of, uh, of fuels reduction, um, and so uh, you know that's that's how industry partners have to play in this in this area to to make their sawmill or you know their 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 contracting operation work. I'm sort of just curious um, on the uh, ignition of past wildfires, like in the last decade, and um, you know where are they starting? Where are they coming from? Are they coming from the backcountry? Um, does anyone kind of you know are they wind driven? Um, what is sort of what is that whole playbook on ignition of fires in and around Central Oregon, not just Bend? Yeah, and I, um, so I, I guess, uh, you know, our, our number one cause um, uh, locally in the area is human cause. Uh, that's, we're just above 60% human caused fire starts. Um, you know, this, this fire uh, was, was caused by human uh, activity, arson, unfortunately. Uh, you know, uh, we've had a number of other fires that have this very similar fire scar on the landscape that were human caused. You know, they, these are wind-driven fires. Uh, if, you, if you 
look at a map um, of this fire and the two bulls fire, they're, they're pretty much a mirror image of each other. Um, two bulls started a little farther away from town um, and we were able to wrangle that to keep it out of, out of any, any homes. But you know, these, it, it's kind of eerie uh, when you look at these uh, two fire scars, two bulls and this one, that they're very, very much the same. And that's a human element. Um, you know, that is one, one piece that we work really close with our partners on in prevention, um, trying to reduce those human, human starts. You know, the, ma the majority of our human starts are debris burning in the spring. Um, everybody's trying to clean up, get things ready for fire season. Uh, but you do have these unfortunate events that happen either June or August um, that, uh, that are difficult to, to suppress and, and keep at a small, small footprint. So on a lighter note, um, in the city of Bend, in the neighborhoods, you seem to have a very effective uh, fuels reduction program carried out by the urban deer population. Do you recognize and how do you show appreciation uh, in the uh, in the city, I don't know, Todd. Do you have an answer for that? Uh, feed them well. Feeding the deer is illegal. I'm not going to make it easy so. on you. So. <laughs> um, when we think about our response, I'm thinking about uh, some comments Joe made around severity and, and Amanda made around contractors. And when I think about AOL, it's more than just logging contractors. And so when we think about our response and a fire that goes 3,500 acres in a couple hours, we quickly call on contractors too, as far as for initial attack and extended attack. And so can you speak to that on the cruise equipment, heavy equipment and engines on how that helps and maybe a little bit on the pre-positioning in front of events that we take time to spend money and get people in the right places on. Yeah, I, I, I guess for first and foremost, we're pretty lucky here because our contracting industry uh, is, is set up. There's a lot of contract resources locally here just because it is, it is a higher fire area um, and they've, they've taken advantage of that for sure which is a good thing for us because we, we can try to grab them as soon as we can. Um, you know, we do have, uh, you know, uh, federal contractors. Uh, we have state contractors. We, we on the district have uh, incident resource agreements that we have with local landowners, local operators uh, that we can utilize. Um, you know, so we, throughout the year, uh, you know, for lightning events that you can somewhat predict and for weather events that you can somewhat predict, we, we definitely use severity funds uh, to bring some of those resources in to uh, stand by and stage. Our federal partners do the same with, with their, their resource capabilities and their severity programs. Um, we move aircraft around, uh, you know, we try to move aircraft around the state, those severity aircraft. Uh, as a, as ODF and as federal agencies, um, so there's there's a lot uh, a lot happening uh, with movement of those resources as fire danger uh, uh, warrants. You know, uh, with with the implementation of 762, I don't want to forget State Fire Marshal. You know, they moved resources in locally uh, to help the local fire districts. Uh, last summer, uh, which was very critical, especially during a few fires that we had locally here in Central Oregon. Um, I think they they were staged in the right place at the right time uh, to help the local fire districts here as well. So, thanks, Brian. So there was a little bit of conversation about you know the the milling infrastructure in around in this in this country Gil, Gilcrest specifically, and I, I just want to point out that mills in eastern Oregon and much of the state were dependent on federal timber supply, not necessarily private timber lands. 
there isn't enough private timberlands in, in this area or much of eastern Oregon to support that kind of milling infrastructure. Um, you know, it's when, when I, I, Crown Pacific and what they did and how they harvest, I, I don't know any specifics about that specifically regarding, but I, I think if we're going to see having those kind of resources, having that militia that still exists where I am in Northeast Oregon, we still have a contract force, we still have a milling infrastructure. Um, it's really going to be the federal timber supply or is, is going to create that. There just isn't enough private timberlands here to support that kind of, you know, mills and milling infrastructure. We, we're fortunate here we still have a mill here, here locally, um, but certainly very, very fragile. And, and, and that's something I think we can't say enough. It's certainly in eastern Oregon, this infrastructure is incredibly, incredibly fragile. It's in, in the way uh, logging has gone the technology, the cost, the capital investment in moving into logging is just, it, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling how much money that's required to be in this kind of industry these days. It's just really changed. And so, so anyway, that, that's just, when, when we start talking about private timberlands and so on and, and kind of the history here, I think it's, it's important to understand that milling infrastructure was built on federal timber supply. I guess I'd, I'd just add on to that, Joe, that um, that has affected our resource um, capabilities for, for response uh, significantly. We have we have difficult time finding a dozer operator to come operate our cats for us because they're, that, that industry is no longer there operating in the woods. So that skill set is gone. Um, so, you know, um, that that's one piece that really affects us. So, I, you know, I, I think that's a, a good point. Thanks. Not seeing any more questions, but did have maybe a couple comments to a few things that folks have said. Uh, great conversation and great questions, so thanks thanks for the engagement. This stop was really focused on kind of the suppression side of the equation. I think we're going to talk uh, landscape uh, resiliency and uh, community stuff at, at further stops. But as, as I think back to the conversation on this and where have we gone with our suppression effort, uh, over the last 30 years, I think what you heard and the take home here is that we've learned a lot. Uh, some of the things that we that we struggled with 30 years ago on Aubrey Hall with communication with kind of disparate agencies doing different things uh, in different ways has gone by the wayside. And I think we've seen a better way to conduct business for the taxpayers of Oregon, of Central Oregon, uh, Forest Service, you, you name it. All Oregonians are seeing a better response and that has come about through some tough lessons. Uh, and I'm not saying that people that were here fighting the fire in Aubrey Hall did anything wrong. Uh, it's, we fought fire the way we did then because that's what we knew. But we know more now. And we have learned that the relationships across boundaries, the interagency partnerships uh, are absolutely critical to the success for the folks that are paying us to do this work. And so you heard Gordon talk about the meetings and sometimes we, we struggle that we, we meet too much, but we really don't. Because when we, when we are meeting consistently across agency lines, whether it's State Fire Marshal and ODF or Bend Fire and ODF or the Forest Service and OSFM, all of us are, ha have a piece in this suppression effort, every one of us. And when we do it collectively and we all bring the strengths that individual agencies have or entities, we come out the other side in a much better spot. And so what, what I have seen in my time here in Central Oregon is really a seamless effort uh, when the fire bell goes off. And it's, it's a pretty amazing thing to watch. Doesn't mean we don't have some bumps in the road. Uh, Kevin has to kick on me once in a while back, back when I was here. Uh, and, and, but as we look at where we've gone and where we're going, as we look to continued challenges in the wildland urban interface with fire. If you look at the potential for significant wildfires on the landscape, we know that the communication and the relationships is gonna be that much more important. So we're not letting our foot off the gas because we're in a better spot than we were 30 years ago. We're gonna to continue to work that angle really, really hard and continue to do the best we can. 
with that, there's a partnership with lawmakers, right? So Joe talked about severity aircraft. In 1990, we did not have a severity program like we do now. Three years ago, we didn't have the severity program that we have now. So investments in the past biennium at the legislative level into our severity program have created a scenario that gives us a better chance to be successful at keeping fires small on the landscape. And that's what we're all here to do. So uh, there's been continued investments and there will need to be con further investments, but we're in a good spot now and, and a far better spot than we were say 30 years ago. So uh, maybe I'll close there unless there's some additional questions, but there was, a, there was a dead spot and I don't like the uncomfortable silence. So I'll start talking. Maybe I'll turn it over to Ryan. So are there any more questions or discussion here? Give a little awkward silence. All right, so we're about 15 minutes ahead of schedule. I think it's important that we maintain our schedule though. Folks are expecting us to be kind of on time along the tour route. So let's just plan to be uh, wheels up out of the parking lot here, just a little shy of uh, 10.30. I will mention uh, that the uh, drive to the next stop is going to be a little bit uh, roundabout. It's an opportunity to take a look at some fire resilient uh, development uh, along the way. Um, so with that, I think I'll turn you loose. Reminder, uh, restrooms available at the end of this and uh, around 10.30. Thanks. Okay, folks. Welcome to stop two. I see a few folks have already started to make their way to the trees to hide from this weather. Just for context, uh, State Forester Mukamoto gave me a charge to delay fire season and change the weather and get it to rain and snow. I, I've been working hard on it. I cannot take credit for it, but I'm very thankful that uh, we've gotten a little bit of moisture, even as sporadic as that is. So I, I'm working on it. Rather than you calling me out, I thought I'd be I'd jump in front of you today. All right, so uh, welcome to Stop 2. Again, Mike Shaw, uh, Protection Division Chief for the agency. And really, you know, the first stop was, was about suppression and, and what, what have we done uh, for effective suppression and what has changed over time. And now we're transitioning into, uh, you know, I like to say we can't suppress our way out of the wildfire program, problem that Oregon has. And so what is the next thing that we're gonna do? And so we're gonna step into mitigation efforts and landscape resiliency. And, and uh, we had a nice drive for those that, that followed the circuitous route through uh, the Miller Tree Farm, looking at a, at a community that was developed uh, with some of, the, some of the topics that we're gonna be talking about with um, home hardening techniques and, and home densities and uh, uh, resilient fire resilient plants and landscaping and some of those some of those things so I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Josh who's going to introduce himself and start talking about kind of cross boundary mitigation efforts and how do we deal with uh, with the fuels problems that we have all right thanks Mike good morning everyone um, my name is Josh Bernard, and I'm serving as the Interim Forest Resources Division Chief. And today's discussion will highlight um, the 10-year uh, history and milestones of the West Bend Project. Uh, speakers will address some of the key challenges of collaborative work that cross multiple ownerships and discuss strategies for maintaining momentum and focusing on implementation. <clears throat> Topics will include landscape-level work in the area, and challenges of working in the wildland urban interface and building and funding landscape scale mitigation and restoration projects. Uh, joining us today for that conversation will be uh, uh, Forest Supervisor Holly Jukes, um, Forest Service uh, Central Oregon Fire and Aviation Staff Officer Kevin Stock, and ODF All Lands Initiative Unit Manager Jeff Burns. Uh, before we jump in, um, I wanted to touch briefly on uh, a recent reorganization with an ODF. I believe you've heard us speak about it before, but for folks that aren't, um, following the 2021 legislative session, ODF uh, received one of the most significant investments um, in its history. Uh, and so last fall, um, following that legislation, and uh, also with the uh, Private Forest Accord, another significant investment, um, 
the agency met internally and we decided to restructure a little bit. And you'll see a little bit of that on the tour stops two, three, and four today as we move through the tour. Uh, we basically uh, took what was formerly our private forest division and our partnership in planning and we uh, moved into uh, the private forest division, the operational components of our federal forest restoration program and also the operational components of our landscape resiliency program and put those all into one branch of what is now the forest resources division um, with the thought of increasing our effectiveness as we try to implement um, mitigation and restoration and assist landowners at scale here in Oregon. And so with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Holly to provide an overview of the work in the area. Well, good late morning. Um, I'm glad we're having this weather. I know it's uncomfortable of you standing out in it, but uh, as, as Mike shared, anything that delays fire season feels good right now. Um, I'm Holly Jukes. I'm the forest supervisor here on the Deschutes, so welcome to the Deschutes National Forest. And just a little context for where we're standing. We are standing in a portion of the West Bend Project um, next to Phil's Trailhead, which is, if you're not familiar with, is a very popular mountain bike trail system. Um, so the weather is probably helping us with parking this morning uh, here. So I'm going to share a couple of thoughts and also want to acknowledge there's folks um, on this tour today that probably have better perspective and different perspective around the West Bend Project and the collaborative work um, that the forest has done with the Deschutes Collaborative Forest Project over the last 10 plus years. So certainly as questions come in later on, I, I welcome those perspectives to, to join in. So when I think about restoration and fuels reduction in a landscape like the Deschutes National Forest, um, I think about the complexities and some of the challenges that, that we see not only in a place like this, but across, across the National Forest. Um, we've been implementing this project since 2014, um, and we're not done yet. And I know Kevin's going to talk a little bit more about the prescribed burning work that we have left to do. But in a place like Bend or Sisters or the Lapine Basin um, around the Deschutes, you know, we're the direct wildland urban interface, and a lot of national forests aren't like that. There's about 300,000 acres of the Deschutes that really isn't within a mile of a structure. And as, as we drove in here, you saw the houses off to the side. And that's not completely unique, but it is fairly unique for the national forest system that we're the immediate neighbor, right? And we're not just uh, a distant view from your window, but we're right next door. Um, and I... Thinking about Phil's trailhead, I think it's really important to highlight our role um, around tourism and the economy here in recreation and how much of an important driver that is for Central Oregon. There was some research that was just completed in late 2021 looking at um, the amount of money spent um, in Deschutes County, just for trail trips alone. Um, was about $138 million in 2021 for people visiting and recreating around trails in Central Oregon and specifically Jesus County, just for uh, an order of magnitude. And as it was mentioned in our last stop, population growth and community change in Central Oregon is pretty amazing. Um, lots of community growth. Um, lots of different expectations, and people are, are, are coming here for the landscape, um, the landscape of the Deschutes, as well as the other public land in Central Oregon. And as also mentioned at the last stop, you're going to hear a lot of the same themes, I think. With that, with that change, you know, the public information and education, whether it's around prescribed fire or thinning, is a constant, right? Our population keeps turning over, new people come in, and that need is really important. And that's really important with our partners, whether it's Oregon Department of Forestry. And it's also been an integral part of the collaborative. The Chutes Collaborative Forest Project has really helped us as the Forest Service get to our community, help people understand the nature of living in a fire-adopted landscape, the importance of prescribed fire, and why some of that smoke in the spring or the fall is better smoke than the smoke we get from large fires. And I also wanted to touch on, you know, some of the opportunities in front of us. Um, as has been talked about a lot, Senate Bill 762, um, 
Central Oregon has also been highlighted as one of the focus areas for the Forest Service wildfire crisis strategy that the infrastructure bill funds will contribute to that. But it's also about the next 10 years in Central Oregon for the, for the Forest Service. How do we do the work like we've done here? And then how do we maintain that into the future? Because uh, I think Mike, Mike shared, it doesn't stop, right? Nature continues to grow. We have to come back and do those maintenance activities, whether it's mowing or burning a prescribed fire. So I think, you know, when I think about where we are today on the Deschutes and in Central Oregon, you know, we're not much different than other places in the West. We're sitting in exceptional drought. We see fires not that far away from us that are, were unimaginable to, to me at least a few years ago. I think about the fires we saw in the Fremont Wainema in Bootleg and, and the West Side fires, and we're really not any different. So I think about how can we best be prepared. I think the investments from Senate Bill 762 the wildfire crisis strategy and reflecting back on the collaborative forest landscape project, um, federal forest restoration funds, joint chiefs funding has all gotten us to this place. And I think we have a lot of opportunity going forward. So I wanted to share some questions with this group because I know there's a lot of good thinking in brains uh, to maybe ponder as we continue our discussion. How do we create that appropriate sense of urgency around the need for restoration work with the public in the communities before the fire happens? so that we can live with fire? How do we tell the story of a fire-adapted ecosystem in the importance of restoration to water supply, the recreation setting, the economy, and industrial and aquatic flora and fauna? How do we best leverage across agencies and the opportunities in front of us to get the best work done in a timely way across ownerships? How do we implement shared stewardship at a larger scale? I would say I think Central Oregon is, is well set up for that. The collaborative history we just heard about when we talk about fire management, I think has translated over into fuels management and restoration, and we have a lot of work to do. Um, that cross-agency cross coordination, relationships, a unified voice are critical success factors. It will take collaboration, it will take commitment, it will take alignment, and for me, I think it will take us all. So with that, thanks for the time. And I think I'm passing it to Mr. Stock. Well, I can kind of see, see I need my wipers on. Um, I'm Kevin Stock. I'm the fire staff officer for um, Central Oregon Fire Management, which is the Deschutes, Ochoco National Forest, Primeville BLM, and the Crooked River National Grassland. So I got... 13 million acre footprint in Central Oregon with about uh, 4 million acres of federal land in it. And, and I end up with a lot of different partners because of that. It's a pretty, pretty big chunk of the state of Oregon. Um, my career uh, is kind of fun. We start off with Aubrey Hall. I was a college student when Aubrey Hall happened. I was taking business administration. Um, I got to see that fire and I decided a career change was, was more in line with my uh, skill set. So I planned. To, I started fighting fire in 1991, and, and most of my career since 1995, anyways, has been in this area and on this forest. So I've kind of seen a lot of those changes that have happened on the ground, um, and one of them is the West Bend project. Uh, so just just a little bit of background on this area again. <clears throat> so you have Aubrey Hall, but fires here on Deschutes. We're kind of weird. Fire likes to burn up hill most places, but on Deschutes, it likes to start up on the mountains, and it likes to run with the wind to the east. So along the crest, it comes down, and it, and it runs west to east and comes towards your towns, right? And then it, on the flatlands here, fire tends to run either north or south, depending on whether it's a cold front pushing it or it's just a normal hot day. It tends to go towards the lava flow on a hot day. So... Anyways, that, that's kind of the big picture. So this, this area here is basically our wall between the forest and, and, the, and the city. Um, and this is where the fires were going to come. So for years, we had, like, no treatment here. You had full-on forests that had been logged pretty much flat in, in the Brooks Scanlon, Shevlin, Hickson days, right? And, and then this is all second growth, and it's all even-aged, and it's all kind of out of whack. Um, so that's what we start off with. It's not the best firefighting environment, right? Like we would get fires start out here and they transition up into the canopy. You get, you could get 
you know, crown fires really easy and they get moving quick and you're right outside of town. So, so the idea with, with West Bend and a few of the other projects that we had is, you know, we got money in the early 2000s to treat urban interface. We looked at where our starts were and like had been mentioned earlier, over 50% of our starts are human starts um, in central Oregon and they're adjacent to our, surprisingly, right? They're adjacent to your population centers and they're along your river corridors. Anywhere where there's water, that's where people are, and that's where you get your start. So this is one of those areas. Um, West Bend's a 20,000-acre project. Um, like Holly said, it got signed in 2014. We're still, we're still logging on it, right? We're still, um, we're still working our way through. And we started with what I like to call the shock and awe uh, idea of starting right next to the the urban interface and working our way away from it, both with logging and with prescribed fire. We're, we're right next to values at risk in everybody's face right at the start of the project and then we'll move away from it. So um, it's a 20,000 acre uh, planned 20,000 acres of prescribed burning out here in, in the 10 years that we've been burning on it, um, or eight years, I guess, uh, we've completed 2,000 acres. And, and and uh, the 2,000 acres, while it's not a lot, is very strategic. It's basically a line um, with with a few of the cross-boundary burns that we've done. We've tied everything in from two bowls to the river and lava flow. Um, has a burned a burned fuels treatment all along the private property boundary um, for that whole stretch, um, which gives us you know a good place to defend if a fire did get get going farther out, we would have a, a easy place to defend. This unit here was probably burned, um, I'm guessing, a, you know, a little, little fuzzy, but I want to say six, seven years ago. Um, you know, here in this moisture regime, we're probably, we, we probably wouldn't generate a crown fire again in here after a burn in probably 15 years. Um, you know, it, it's going to grow back in. We need to come back in with a maintenance treatment, but when you when you've done the vegetated treatments and then you follow up prescribed burning, it's a it's a good investment because it it protects for like 15 years. If we just mowed this and we have a we have some units in the old Aubrey Hall fire that we just mowed and did mechanical treatments without burning, um, they grew back in in five years. So there's enough moisture here to get stuff to grow. If you if you just think that logins it or mowins it. It, it won't do it. Fire is part of this environment, and it's the the final the final touch that we need to do. So um, I said we've done 2,000 acres, and and part of that is that there's a lot of barriers to prescribed fire out here. Um, you know, in fire we talk about the Swiss cheese model a lot of things lining up, and you get the hole through the Swiss cheese, and bad things happen. Here, Swiss cheese is kind of the model for prescribed burning. You have to line it up of it's dry enough to burn, but wet enough to control. You have the social aspect of bend, right? It's Phil's trail. It, it's affecting the, if you're doing it on a weekend, you are ticking off a lot of business owners. You're ticking off a lot of people who came out here from Portland or wherever to come ride their bike. And now you're going to burn and shut down part of this trailhead. Um, there isn't a weekend in central Oregon that doesn't have a festival, um, doesn't have pull pedal paddle, doesn't have some other social thing that's a big deal to this town. We have a festival for like something every week, right? You know. Um, so so there's there's that aspect. And then smoke management on top of it. Again, the winds prevailing out of the west. Um, smoke at night goes downhill. Fires want to go towards town. Where's the smoke going to go? The same place that fire wants to go. It goes straight towards town. Um, and so we've, we're pretty restricted out here. I think the biggest burn unit we've done is probably 300 acres. Um, and we didn't get town that day, but we've, we've gotten town plenty of times with 40 acres. And again, smoke management does a good job of trying to line it up and we can push that smoke all the way down. It could, it could head south all the way to Crescent. And again, at night, it's going to come back down the river and come back right into town. So it's just, 
it, everything's lined up against us to be successful smoke management on 100% keeping fire outside of out of the city. It's just it's not going to happen or, or smoke. I mean, so um, we're working with smoke management right now because honestly, from DQ or EPA standpoint, they look at smoke as something that can be controlled. Right? It's it's not it, it's a it's a problem that needs to be taken care of. The forest doesn't look at it like that. Fire is a natural part of of this uh, of the cycle out here, and so smoke is a natural part. And again, like we've heard earlier, right? There's that discussion of wildfire smoke, which impacts the city of Bend all summer long. At least the last few years, it's been coming mainly from West Side fires, but um, smoke comes in here and chokes us out all summer. And really what you're talking about here with prescribed fire smoke isn't the day of while we're burning. We're not sending smoke in town. It's that night for, you know, two to three hours between two and six in the morning. It, it sits down at the river right where the nephilometer is, which, you know, if I had a plastic bag and no one was looking, I could fix. But anyways, th- those are challenges. So. Again, lining all that stuff up. And then there's other things, too. You know, there's wildlife restrictions. It's winter range or there's birds or whatever. All those things line up to make it really tough to burn out here. And, again, we've gotten that initial rind, um, but we should be coming back in here. And and the goal in West Bend is to burn that 20,000 acres twice if we can. Um, So hit hit it once, burn it, come back in. Five, six, seven years later, uh, I will say uh, DQ and OD, ODF smoke management does appreciate it when we do second entry burns because the smoke is not really there at night. It basically goes away. It's these things right here that really get us on that first entry, right? It's these old stumps. They catch on fire. They burn. Second entry, they're usually not there. Usually they're they're gone. They're burned off. They don't. They're not smoke generators, so... It's less of a challenge. Um, Trying to think if there's anything else. I'll I'll just leave it like that. And if you guys got questions, you can ask me about that after. All right. right. Jeff, you ready? Yeah, thank you, Josh. Uh, so my name is Jeff Burns. I'm with the Oregon Department of Forestry. I'm the All Lands Initiatives Unit Manager. And uh, I really appreciate moments like this because I uh, lead a team of grants and agreements experts um, that we uh, kind of stay in our bubble in Salem and read about uh, scopes of work and budgets at our desk and to come out and to actually see, um, you know, the uh, the the, the product that's out here at the end of all that is really special. And it kind of reminds me of the work that we do um, is important. And it's, it, it, it gives me a little bit of energy to go back and uh, take a look at those agreements again and continue that work. Um, so I really appreciate this time to be here. Uh, I just uh, was listening this morning to some folks talk about the history of the area and some of the improvements that have been made, especially uh, Gordon was discussing improvements in suppression and working across boundaries in that world. And I got to thinking about, um, you know, behind the scenes, some of the, um, you know, financial aspects and how we fund these projects and how we, uh, you know, put agreements together. And and there's been a a transformation in that world as well over the years. Um, And it's not not nearly as evident probably because it is, it only touches a few folks and it's, uh, you know, in those offices that we do that work. Uh, but I think it's important to discuss as well some of the history of, of where we are with the um, uh, funding mechanisms that we utilize and, um, you know, how we agree to make these things work um, before the project even gets kicked off. So I think back of um, ODF specifically, and, and I come from another state as well, uh, and across the, the country uh, where we have utilized federal funds quite nicely, um, and I think really um, efficiently uh, with, you know, a, a defensible space around a structure somewhere. Uh, and that meant something, you know, 20 years ago, perhaps. And I'm, I think defensible space is really important. I'm not going to say that it's not uh, very useful. Um, but it was a single effort. 
and uh, you know those funding mechanisms that we have that we had then were, were focused on that and so there were some limitations to that funding and it was specifically federal funding with some other limitations as well um, like uh, match requirements and other requirements of how we track those funds and again all really good for that time um, but in the big scheme of things we've had to change how we look at, at those uh, bits and pieces of not only the work on the landscape but how we support that behind the scenes with our um, funding mechanisms as well. And so uh, Joint Chiefs is a, a good example of, of what began to, to change. And so, you know, that defensible space out there in 100,000 acres of lodgepole pine is not necessarily what we're looking at doing now. And so um, we've been, been able to uh, manipulate agreements and change scopes of work and broaden our partnerships across um, you know, those entities and the landscape to all of a sudden look at a Joint Chiefs type project or a landscape resiliency program type project, which goes well beyond the individual and it's a cross boundary um, effort. And, and that has become really important. And so we've been able to remove some barriers, I think. Others still exist in that world of, of finance and, and how we fund these projects. There's a lot of different colors of money, and we've discussed that to some degree today, um, where we've, and I just mentioned federal funds through the state and private forestry program, where, which we've uh, partnered quite well with our Forest Service folks for many years. But now we're looking at um, you know, new funding sources and new interest, uh, for instance, using general fund through SB 762. And that has become really important because it's a different color of money. And that, is, that allows us to do a few things. It allows us to meet match requirements with federal funds. It allows us to not necessarily have all of the strings attached that we might have, but we have other strings that are attached with those funds that also need to be uh, checked and balanced. And so that's my perspective, is looking at that and making sure that the funding is available and that the mechanism is available for the folks on the ground to get the work done but also we have to answer questions and, and be accountable for every penny of those as well to our constituents. And that's the general public, the legislature, those interested parties. And so I think that that transition over time um, has, has been um, maybe not as, as seen as these projects, but the same thing is happening in those offices across the nation to help uh, get out of the way, frankly, of these great projects and support them the best we can. I will say that uh, a little bit more about 762 and, and some of the things that we're doing, um, and it's not 762 in the whole scheme of things about wildland urban interface mapping and that. Very specifically, it's about tracking those funds and building new and improved programs to put that money on the ground. Um, has put us in a position of um, looking through our historical successes with the Forest Service and some of that funding and thinking, how do we pull success out of those, but then maybe eliminate some of the hardships with that funding and build a new program um, that is a little bit more streamlined and enables us to be a little bit more flexible. And so this, le this latest uh, transition that we've taken in the past year with our landscape resiliency program, and I recognize some folks here that have helped support that, um, and, and thank you for your, your time with us to do that as well as Small Forest Land Grant Program. It's another one that uh, Alex Romlo on my staff has been working on. So we've been able to kind of take the success of past, build it into something into the future, um, and we'll see how it goes. We've, there's a few bumps and bruises along the way, but I think at each moment, each step of the way, working with our partners, um, we're developing new project or new programs, excuse me, um, to be able to uh, use that funding as efficiently um, and in the right place at the right time at scale that we possibly can, knowing that there's new things coming as well. So we look on the horizon and there's infrastructure funds, there's other general fund opportunities perhaps um, through the legislative process that we're, that we're looking at. And so, you know, how do we prepare ourselves to be able to take advantage of those opportunities as well, um, you know, and, and keep track of all that but also remove barriers for these types of projects to be successful on the ground. And I think that's what we're really focusing on as, as we move into the future of um, these funding sources. And again, just to wrap it up, it takes partnerships and it takes relationships. Um, because you know when you're on initial attack and you're pulling hose 
and you see someone from another agency or a nonprofit or, or someone that you know um, from the local community, that's really important in those times. But also, um, it's really important to be able to pick up the phone call or pick up the phone and say, look, this agreement doesn't work for us. There's some language in here that is outdated and it's not really working for the project. Can we make a change? And it's really nice to hear on the other end from another agency perhaps that says, you know what, that doesn't make sense. Let's change that agreement so that it works and we'll go from there and see what happens. And that's really, really important too because that's the way these things get done. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Josh, thanks for the, the time. And if there's some questions, which I think there probably will be, I think we're still available for those. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, questions for any of the panelists? Um, thank, thanks for the presentation. I appreciate it. Um, a couple questions for the, the Forest Service. Um, what was the cost of treatment kind of basically per acre right here? And I really appreciated your you, – you, you, you talked about 300,000 acres within one mile of that, – that, I appreciate that kind of perspective because that's – I mean, that's significant acres – uh, to treat also what you talked about 20,000 acres in this this uh, I forget the name of this whole area West Bend, West Bend was 20,000 acres and how many years ago was that um, 2014. 2014 was the beginning of, of a sign West Bend and you've done a couple thousand acres so 10 percent of it yeah burning mm -hmm. actually it's too too far on the ground but we've we've been treating and we're not we're still doing the vegetation part like it it's it's been it's been done in waves like this this part of the the logging paid for itself in general the trees were a little bit bigger uh, there was a little bit more uh, volume out of uh, we we, we kind of it's kind of funny because we named these timber sales by by uh, currency and so euro is pretty high currency and that's what we're in now and that that had a a good price to it, but now we're at peso and ruble. <laughs> uh, peso and ruble are are areas where there there isn't as much merchantable, and we're paying to uh -huh. get the treatment done. But luckily, we've had Joint Chiefs and we've had um, CFLR and other mechanisms of money to come in and get those treatments done. So it's been it's been getting done uh, in stages. But we again we start off with the chalk and off. We went where we where it paid for itself first, and, and then um, and then worked our way back. No, but I appreciate it. it really illustrates the scale of your issue. You know, you know, three hundred thousand acres within that that's a, that's a significant amount of acres to begin to try to treat. What, how did you determine the density that you cut this down to? What was the? Um, I'm asking hard forestry questions. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> and the only thing, the only thing I'll say is our, our subcultures look at uh, carrying capacity based on the moisture regime of what, because we're moisture limited out here. So, um, when when I when I went back to college, I went back to forestry. So we'll see if any of that rubbed off on me. But uh, so we're we're moisture limited in this forest, right? We're not we're not a nutrient limited it's it's all about how much how much rain you get and, and you don't you don't get that much here so it's taking it down to that level um where where the trees would be healthy so open it up enough uh, to open the canopy enough for for uh for um keeping the crown fires down your cr crown fire ability down but keep the stand stocked enough um that you got good growth out of it based on your moisture limitation. So that's kind of what was driving it. Um, I would look in here afterwards and go, you know, you could take more, you could take less. The one thing I, I like about this stand is, and in, in it comes into a lot of discussions we have about, this is a really uniform stand of trees, right? And that's because the logging happened all at one time and, and the natural regen kind of happened all at one time. The only way you break that up at this stage is for fire to be that that last disturbing factor right so if you open it up too much you don't get you don't get that kind of disturbance in if you keep it too tight we can't burn it so it's a finding that happy medium we come in with fire we take everybody off because some trees turn red you know and i get yelled at and i ruin the forest but at the end of the day it's just little clumps here and there that got burnt and and that's how you get that 
like we've tried silviculturally, silviculturally to, uh, and I don't know how many collaborative minutes. I know some members of collaborative are here, but talking about gappy clumpy and how to get gappy clumpy, and really, the only way to get gappy clumpy is fire, and and it gets it every time. It's like if you come in and treat, no matter what the conditions, everything could be the same. You're going to kill some trees. You some trees are going to just do really great. Some are going to be slowed down, and that creates that uneven stand that we're looking for at the end of the day so thanks hey thomas stokely with uh the nature conservancy second week actually with the nature conservancy and also the central oregon forest stewardship foundation curious you know about the wildlife objectives here close to town you're talking about patchy gump uh patchy gappy clumpy what about, you know, snags and, and coarse wood habitat, those as heavy fuels and smoke? Is this sort of like a sacrifice zone since it's so close to town in terms of smoke management? Yeah. Uh, I, I am an incident commander on one of the interagency teams, so you put a mic in front of me, I'll just have it all day long. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so the the downwood thing, and and again for those on the collaborative, it's a constant discussion, right? There there is no downwood out here. Um, there hasn't been like the, we're deficient on those on those qualities altogether. Pre before we even come in to do harvest, and and uh, and really at the end of the day, again you're starting to see some of that come in. You've probably seen it on a few other other as we were going through Miller Tree Farm, you would see those logs on the ground that are actually what we're looking for, right? But it's post treatment. And so we have this huge debate and fire and wildlife have fun debating that because we don't meet forest plan guidelines when we come into a place and then it's like, well you can't burn because you don't meet forest plan guidelines, but you're not going to meet forest plan guidelines unless we burn and create that down wood. So, and what we're looking for, again, in a place like this where it's wildland or interface, it, it's not so much that it's a sacrifice zone, but we're not looking for a sea of slash. We're looking for some big logs here and there and maybe, you know, some limbs in a, in a spot where it's not looking for a continuous layer. I think... That doesn't stop us from being successful on initial attack or anything like that, occasional big log here or there. Um, obviously, if it's stacked up right on the edge, we might have some issues. But in general, it's not a concern where it's at. I, th I think we can meet both objectives as long as it's not like meeting the full – like the force plant guidance, to me, I, I always joke that we'd have to haul slash in from a lama to actually meet those guidelines, right? That's just a lot of wood on a place that has a fire return interval of 15 years or less. It's just not – the forest plan was written in 1991, um, I think, right? Something like that, 1991, 1992. So science might have changed a little bit since then. Um, the, the key wildlife things out here is it's deer winter range. Um, and, and it's pretty – that's a pretty big ticket item out here. And, and uh, really it's about just, you know, we have wildlife closures during the winter. And that's – this is probably better winter range. But we, we do have discussions about brush a lot also. And uh, opening this up probably will allow a little bit more brush back in the area than the closed canopy was. got a question about ignition um, you know given that you've got this federal forest so close to the city and uh, I think I've witnessed some of this it's pretty obvious in summer that you have a lot of campers including homeless campers who are out there um, and one can suppose that they're not always following the rules um, how big of a problem is that uh, in terms of fire starts and and what are you guys doing about it would you like to come up here and use this mic? <laughs> See, he left me with this one. <laughs> nice guy, isn't he? <laughs> well, what I would say, and, and Kevin can add in, I think um, as, as we shared, you know, human starts do over, overtake our, our lightning starts. Um, 
What I would say is also where we have concentrated recreation use or other use is generally in areas, fortunately, that are treated, right? That's where a lot of our high-use recreation um, and other high-use forest uses that are occurring are. And so that's a positive thing. It allows us to, to be successful in an initial attack. And as Kevin mentioned, some of the history we have with, with fires on the Deschutes is they start up high, um, whether that's lightning or human caused, and then come down to community. So that's been the predominant fire history. The other thing I would say is where we have uses like this and terrain like this, we have a lot more resources that can get there quickly, um, and we're more successful because they're in fuels units. So that's what I would share. Anything you'd add? Uh, again, we, we do get a lot of starts. They, they, in general, don't go anywhere because they are in fuels treatment. So most of... Um, you know, most of the area on the south end of Bend and west end of Bend and, and actually Sun River and La Pine also, we've done those treatments next to Community Sisters. Um, and, and that's where the houseless populations in general are, are camping because, one, it's open um, and, and it's close to town, right? And that's, that's where they're going. And the reason we treated there was exactly that. We were getting a lot of starts. Um, and that's where our risk is. So the, the risk to the community from those ignitions is not huge because, again, this this isn't going to be a crown fire anytime soon, right? It, it's a nuisance, and you're going to get fires, and, and stuff spreads around a little bit, but it's ground fire. It's not crown fire. And that's a completely different thing when you're talking about success and initial attack. I mean, we, we, we can do that all day long. We're successful with flame links, you know, below four feet, easy. Um, with hand tools. And before we move on to the next question, I'll also add if Nathan was here, um, he would bring up the evacuation planning around some of that and working, whether you're houseless or just doing dispersed camping, um, recreating out here. We struggle to get people to sign up for emergency alerts. If you have a phone, um, we want people to know if they're within cell service that if fire is occurring, whether it's prescribed fire, like some of you got the alert for the prescribed fires that are happening this week, um, those are the non-emergency alerts, but we also have the emergency ones when fire is starting to hopefully help people get out of the area um, early rather than um, not knowing or not um, getting out soon enough because we, we know that there are people recreating or living um, longer than their two weeks um, out on our forest lands. So um, on the first few stops, I mean, really great work. And, um, and of course, we're focusing on WUI. But one of the questions that I have, um, because we also have some Forest Service people here, is like, what is, how do you, um, how are you thinking about the entire watershed? Because um, there was a comment, as a lot of, you know, um, at the golf course talking about how many, um, Fires start right, um, you know, within the population center. And then you were talking about fires that start at the top of the ridge and come down. What, how does, um, how do you balance that? Your, you know, the larger landscape, the larger watershed with just the pull and the immediate urgency um, and focus of, you know, the population centers. How are you, I know that's a tough one. How do you, how are you doing it? Uh, you know, it, it's not it's not too tough in the fact that um, you know prescribed burning isn't new to us. We've been doing it most of my career here, and we we started out doing restoration farther out. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, our wooey burning when I first started. We had a little demo, demonstration par project down by a um, high desert museum, and we'd just do little like thirty acre burns and go mop them up really quick, and just to show people that we could burn near the interface but we were burning thousands of acres on the south end of the fort rock because it's big open ponderosa pine stands uh high return interval stuff and we we've done restoration work down on a ton of that so that end of the forest looks really good where, where the issue is that you're talking about like the fires coming you know down off the crest one it's it's wilderness areas that had hadn't burned we've been suppressing fires for 100 years and and they had gotten to a climax stage, right? I mean, they're, they're forests that wouldn't have been logged anyways. They weren't logged to begin with because it's high elevation 
mountain hemlock and, and uh, white fir, not much value in it. Um, it wasn't logged. It, it grew its climax stage, and it's just waiting for a lightning strike. And most of that has burnt, honestly. Through the 2000s, everything west of Sisters, um, that whole piece of the crest has burned. And pretty much to the Bend watershed, um, most of the wilderness is burnt. Um, south of the Ben watershed, there's still quite a bit left that hasn't had fire in it. And there's, um, as far as the wilderness goes, there's not much we can do, um, prescribed fire wise up there. It's just, it's one of those things like lighting it in that environment. It's a, it's a high severity, low frequency fire regime. And, and so, uh, it's meant to burn hot and not very often and it's just not something that you want to go up on an august weekend and go light up right so so our our treatments up there has been where we can treat where the road systems are where it transitions down into ponderosa pine and we've done a lot of treatments out there uh, strategically in different spots so that we do have places to catch those fires coming out of the wilderness um, towards values at risk and we continue doing that we're we're also um and now I'll throw my Kaufman's hat on because I'm not just the Forest Service on the BLM. Um, we're looking strategically, looking at some of the um, risk management analytic tools that are out there now to look at where where does it make sense strategically to put treatments across boundaries, and then what does it take to do that? And I could say, like, um, yesterday, first time ever, Gilchrist State Forest, we burnt 38 acres out down there on agreement with Crescent Ranger District, right? And uh, we're looking at places like between Bend and, and Tumlo. Um, there's places out there where we'll go private, private timberland, um, BLM, back to the forest. Is there a place that we can see where we can strategically tie our fuels treatments off at a place where we'll be successful so if a fire comes up from the Ben watershed down towards values at risk, we would have a good place to, to stand. So we are strategically looking at those spots that aren't necessarily wildland or rare interface because we understand the, the big problem's not going to start at the wildland or rare interface. It usually starts farther out. But we've done a lot of treatments in our wildland or rare face. And actually, I think now we get more starts in the private coming on to us than we do the other way around because we've done these treatments. You know, we're more likely to get a start over there if somebody did a backyard burn and have it threaten our land than vice versa. Got anything to add? Well, I think I would just add as, you know, I think about the Deschutes National Forest and in, in the future, I think obviously restoration work on the forest and the fire adaptive ecosystem is important. And I mentioned the big component about recreation and recreation management. And then the third piece I'd put in there is habitat, right? As we're seeing use just explode here um, and, and, and users be in more places, how do we provide some of that habitat in the intermix with uh, restoring forests and also having that, that place that has that high quality habitat that probably isn't the place for treatment right now as, as Kevin shared in wilderness or other late successional reserve areas and those sorts of things. So for me, it's a balance, um, but certainly focusing on wooey when we're talking about uh, prescribed fire and the fuels work. So that's what I'd add. So uh, we just went through the Miller Tree Farm, and I remember uh, the uh, – so I'm Commissioner Tony DeBone here in Deschutes County. Went through the Miller Tree Farm. We did, uh, you know, the land use associated with that. And it was really special, right? It was a moment. It's like, okay, this is going to be it. This is farthest west we're going to go. It's going to be, you know, premier properties. I didn't know how premier. We just saw it, and that came up real fast. Uh, but, you know, we do have the dispersed camping, and we have workers that are coming and going too. So I'm going to be a strong advocate for it. So this is really a request to the Board of Forestry even – Let's look for those opportunities for campgrounds. You know, as I'm driving up here, as they're just leaving that uh, the Miller Tree Farm, I'm thinking, oh, there's maybe a campground here somewhere. I've called Holly a few times over the last few months. How could we do this? Where could we do this? But there's state lands. There, we have county lands, so state land use system. The zoning doesn't allow us to even do that sometimes. But let's just think about that. What what would that great opportunity be? We've got van life people all over the place coming and going, and it's wonderful. It's a great lifestyle. I get calls from people saying. Uh, we need to get this guy off of this land over here. He's next to my, you know, backyard or whatever. 
and it's somebody with a, a salad growing in a, in a tray on their front uh, hood. It's a solar panel out the back. He's on his laptop. He lives in the East Coast, and he's just here hanging out. So I'm just letting everybody know, let's look for those opportunities for campgrounds. It can be the shock absorber for our housing needs. Uh, the, the more resilient and beautiful and open these forests look, the more people are just going to be like, hey, I'm going to go out there. I can stay there for two weeks, and I'll you know, hang out for a little more. And it's, just, you know, it's not going to scale well. But campgrounds is what I'm advocating for. So if anybody wants to talk to that, please do. But that's just what I'm sharing today. So there we go. Yeah, so just for the record, again, Amanda Sullivan Astor with Associated Oregon Loggers. And before I came to AOL, I worked for the Forest Service. I was Pathways. Uh, and then I work, worked for AFRC. So I never got to work with the Deschutes, uh, but that's a little bit of my background for the federal folks <laughs> in, the, in the room. Um, so, uh, you know, with Senate Bill 762 and the funds that uh, Jeff's been working with, uh, uh, I was on the, the committee that helped get those funds appropriated and, and reviewed those grants. And we've got about $5 million come in to Central Oregon through the Central Oregon Shared Stewardship Landscape Resiliency uh, Project. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and then there's a the match component that the Deschutes put into that. Um, so there's a lot of money just related to general fund and, and federal funds. And then we also have the $4.5 million come into the Deschutes uh, related to this fiscal year related to the IJA funds. So can you help us understand uh, what all of that funding is going to get us? in this area. Uh, I recognize, you know, you talked this, I don't know if this was a traditional timber sale uh, or if this was an IRTC. Um, and then I'm assuming some of the stuff you have further on uh, is, is IRSCs because it's, it's not paying for itself. Um, and a lot of the funds from 762 is all just going to non-commercial as well. But um, can you help us understand how much all that money is going to do in this location and then how we can better utilize tools like the Good Neighbor Authority to leverage commercial value where it does exist uh, to make those funds move further along with, you know, extended KV, K2 funds and things like that. I can start. <laughs> I appreciate the context. No, that's that's really helpful. And I, and I think I'll, I'll lean on some ODF partners around 762. Um, what I would share about um, I think infrastructure and particularly these sales. So everything in West Bend has been either an IRTC, so the timber paid for for the restoration work, or it's an IRSC where we've added funds to get not only the the commercial timber but the the smaller trees as well as things like invasives treated and and road closures in the end. So that's kind of we've used that in, as the West Bend model. I think for me when I think about the infrastructure funds coming. We've had, we've had different pots of money through time, whether it was CFLR or Joint Chiefs to help us do IRSCs, but finding those funds has been a challenge over time. And I think with infrastructure, we'll be able to do more of those IRSCs so we can get the work done in a more complete way in a shorter time period is, is the, the piece I really want to add, because otherwise it, it can take us several years to go through a traditional timber sale and then do a bunch of service contracts after. So that's my, my, one of my big hopes with the infrastructure funds, but would welcome some other thoughts around the, the 762 effort just because we're, we're, we are largely a match for that, but I think it's going to really build on the cross-boundary piece. Uh, so our county forester, Ed Keith, is not in the office this week, So, but he would be the best person to answer this question, so I'll, I'll do my second best. Um, the uh, six-plus million dollar uh, Central Oregon Shared Stewardship Project that was submitted for SB 762 Landscape Resiliency Funds uh, covers a landscape that stretches from all the way from uh, southern Jefferson County into northern Klamath County in, in a band. It does encompass a significant amount of federal land, but uh, none of, uh, not a single one of those uh, state dollars is going to be spent on federal land. Uh, on the contrary, the federal work is, was offered as a match for that, for those funds, so that we could do a massive amount of uh, private land and local government land uh, treatments uh, within that landscape and, and, uh, so, kind of, um, 
we could get you a, a laundry list, or I mean, you probably have access to a laundry list of all of the private and and local you know municipal land ownerships where those SB seven sixty two funds are going to be um, are, are going to be expended. But just really important, uh, you know, to me was that uh, we are doing so much good work on in terms of landscape resiliency on the federal lands that the 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 Forest Service was able to offer that work as match for the state funds within this landscape. Phil, I would only add, and I appreciate that a lot, because that's exactly the way it shook out with our um, agreements with various folks, um, is that uh, when these different colors of funding come through the system, um, you know, it takes a team of folks with partnerships to, to recognize what color of money that is and how it can be spent on the ground and how it cannot be spent on the ground. And those limitations sometimes, well, they limit how we do business. Um, but the diversity of funding that, that is becoming available and we're beginning to get over some of those limitations and being able to kind of, I say, blur the lines a little bit because when I think of projects like this, it doesn't matter if this has been, um, if this is green money or red money or blue money, the job has been done and then we've got people back at the shop that'll that'll track each color of money and make sure that it's being spent appropriately and can be accounted for. Um, but out here, you know, the, those folks hitting the trailhead, they don't care where this funding came from. It's just that this job is done. So just a, a perspective there. Thanks, Phil. Hey, I just wanted to do a periodic um, acronym check-in. Um, this this you know we've got a lot of different folks here, so just reminding you all. Um, to not go into that foreign language of, of acronyms that, uh, that that loses some of us. So. There you go. Hi, everyone. My name is Sage Barnard Davidson, and uh, I recently uh, stepped into the role as project coordinator with the Central Oregon Forest Stewardship Foundation. And I wanted to speak about that uh, LRP project as well. Um, we're one of the partners involved in the project, and we're on the implementation and uh, the implementation monitoring and coordination side of that. And what we're really trying to do with this project as well is uh, understand what works well with about uh, 16 different partners involved in this large grant coming to the area, what doesn't work well, and how we can get people to convene around resources to do landscape level forest stewardship to be really effective in the long term uh, because you really need to engage the private partners as well as the local partners with the federal land for there to be large scale uh, stewardship done in the area for the forests. So uh, I'd love to speak more about that if anybody's interested, but I wanted to contribute that as well. We are, you know, part of the project is looking at how do we create a model for this many different diverse partners to work well together so that we can convene around opportunities like this in the future. Um, going back to your original um, talk about the 2,000 acres you've already burned and the 18,000 acres I think you have to go, and I think that was really impactful about all the challenges for um, prescribed fire and with smoke especially. And I guess this is, I have a two-part question. One, I think 762 was supposed to have sort of opened some doors there to make things easier for prescribed fire. And I'd be curious um, what might come out of that. And two, what else the state, the, could, et cetera, could do to make that work better? I'm going to give you a really bad answer. <laughs> Just kidding. I'll, t I'll try my best. So Senate Bill 762 doesn't have anything as it relates to smoke management. There is a component of prescribed fire, and we just stood up a certified burn manager program. And you folks just approved a rule that will help uh, move the needle, hopefully, on prescribed fire as it relates to privately owned lands. Statutorily, we used to be tied to there was legal restrictions to fire crossing property lines and we've taken that out. So that now, as long as all partners agree and there's agreement across property lines, generally speaking with private landowners, the Forest Service has always been willing for us to do cross boundary burns and we have been relatively reluctant to do that. And so uh, that's opened the door to do cross boundary burns on private land. Again, I think this is just the first step. 
the agency for a variety of reasons. In For 23 years in my career, we've been talking about prescribed fire on private land. And it started where the the probably the holdup was internally to the landowners. They weren't really open to fire. Private landowners are generally a fire averse community. They don't like fire. That's why we go put out fire. I think over the last 23 years, what I've seen is a an increased interest in putting fire back on the ground in certain places by some landowners. And some of our rules and liability uh, have restricted us from being able to help landowners in that endeavor. This will help us get there. It's not going to solve the problem. Uh, there's a whole lot of work to go. Uh, we just added a uh, prescribed fire coordinator, which is going to be really critical to us starting to unlock the challenges that we are going to have to face uh, to get beyond where we can actually put fire on the ground on private land. But we're getting there. Smoke management is a whole different issue, and I honestly, you have national air quality standards and, and DEQ involvement and, and ODF implements the smoke management uh, process, and you've got these challenges with communities that have smoke receptor uh, populations and, and smoke into communities, and I think probably the best thing we can do, realizing that we're, there's going to be restrictions on smoke entering these areas is we have to do a better job of educating folks and i think we're working on it again we're not there smoke for two days at the right time of the year in low amounts is far superior to smoke at the wrong time of the year that smokes out of community for three weeks or a month impacts tourism economies a whole variety of things and so trying to get that word out and trying to start to move the needle further. And, and we made huge progress with smoke management rules over the last few years, but I think these folks would probably agree with me, we're still not there. So continued future work uh, to get there. Okay, we've got one last question just to keep us on time. I think I saw a hand back here. Okay, and then and then we'll be off to the next stop after this one. Well, I, I Ben, I appreciate your question. I, I, you kind of asked the question I was wanting to ask, but I was going to put it back on the board and maybe leadership of ODF to give us your thoughts on culturally across agencies working with DEQ, recognizing that they do have the regulatory requirement to, to, to develop the SIP and work with EPA on implementing air quality standards. And sorry. Oh, Jim, I'm sorry. Chair Kelly, state implementation plan. I just blew your rule. Um, yeah, so under the state implementation plan, so how, what, what is the opportunity for the board uh, to work with, say, the EQC or other agencies to help understand the scale of the challenge we have here? Kevin pointed it out. You know, we have 18,000 acres, and that's just one project. If you think about across all of central Oregon or across, you know, Baker City is facing a similar challenge, Pendleton, all these other communities that live downslope of these really important treatments that are going to, we know fire is critical to restore resilience, to increase the climate adaptation capacity of these landscapes. And I think, frankly, to maintain that lowered risk that we're all talking about we want to achieve, fire has to be a part of that equation. So what's the role of the board to work across agencies and really bring this whole of government approach to solve what I think is a very critical uh, barrier or impediment? Here you go, Chair Kelly. <laughs> yeah, give me the easy ones. Um, you know, there's there, there, obviously no easy answers, but I think, you know, what's our job? Our job, we're about forests, you know, and we're about forest resiliency. And so we're going to push that. We, we have regular meetings with the EQC and all of that. And, of course, they've got um, – a, a, a different job, and, and, and so we're not going to be obviously uh, oblivious to the the public health issues and all of the other issues that. But I, I think it's our job to be pushing um, the agenda that leads us to uh, to forest health and to resiliency. And so we will. You know, I, I know there's a lot of people in the department who are working on these things all the time, and you know. But I think. You rightly say that that it's uh, it is our job um, uh, to to be pushing um, uh, this agenda that uh, brings us towards better forest health. Well, 
One more comment, looks like. It is just a comment. So uh, prescribed burn smoke. Uh, we, we did get past it. The collaborative in, in central Oregon, Deschutes County, uh, a couple years ago, we just kind of got over that hump. You know, as a sitting commissioner, we celebrate it in the spring and the fall. We have people call and ask, uh, but we have other advocates in the community that say, oh, no, this is the good smoke. So I just want, if, if everybody doesn't know, it has happened here. We celebrate the uh, prescribed burn smoke in, in central Oregon. We, we we gained some smoke management flexibility, you know, for a year or two, and now we're already backsliding on that uh, with the state. So the the, the the regulatory issues that Peter's pointing out um, are are critically important for us to 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 address, and the help of the board of forestry would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, I think that's the key point, right? The community has bought in in general. I mean, we have a few sleepy yokes that are going to put less smoke, but in general. In, it's it's the regulatory part, right? It's that the the NACs and the the EPA. It's it's based on you know like Bend isn't anywhere near a non-attainment area anymore, and the fact that like those rules are based when we were we were primarily heated by wood, and it was winter time where Bend would smoke in like nobody's business. I'd just choke you to death in the early '90s on a winter. A winter morning and how how choked out this town was so those rules are built based on a wood stove mentality and it's not wood stove it's forced restoration that's causing the issue now and again it's short term it's not like it's not like ben's got bad air quality if you stack it against most of the west side counties we we have a better air quality index over a year than most west side counties do it's it's one night you know, or two nights in a row for four hours. So it's a, it's a, that's a discussion we need to have. And I think, um, you know, again, it's hard for us to advocate against it because it's another federal agency that's saying that we have the smoke standard. It's you guys that that might have a little bit more sway on that than we would. So that's where I go. I mean, I We had to, we've, we've had to put in place all sorts of communication and education and um, systems to give people, vulnerable populations, warnings that there, there is going to be smoke. And, and uh, you know, we're not, not to the point where people, where we're buying people air filters for, the, for their house yet. But uh, we've done a lot of things so that um, when those little windows happen, the people who are vulnerable um, can protect themselves and and know that they need to do that and um, so to have that kind of that that flexibility kind of clawed back from us now is it's a real it's a real challenge. You know, not to advocate our responsibility, but I think the other piece of this, you know, when we're trying to push on these other state departments uh, like the EQ um, to be more cooperative, it's really going to require leadership from the top. And that's really talking about the governor, governor's office, and the legislature. So, uh, you know, now that we're facing uh, an election for governor, I think this is something we as all citizens need to be loud and clear and say, we're, we're going to want this kind of leadership. We've got to have this. Uh, we've got to ma make this difference in our force. And because, and, um, you know, we can push as a department and as a board. Um, but we can only get so far without that leadership at the top. Well, we clearly hit a uh, <laughs> meaty topic, an important topic, uh, but it is lunchtime or time to head towards lunch. So I'm going to call a close to discussion here. Uh, there'll be an opportunity over lunch, I think, for some informal conversation on the side as well. Um, so I would certainly encourage that. Uh, we're going to caravan over to the lunch location uh, the program there will start around 1245, so that'll give you some time to get your lunches and get situated. Uh, we'll have about another half an hour or so of facilitated discussion there, uh, and I think we depart at uh, 2 o'clock. And maybe most importantly, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a fire there, uh, so we can warm up a little bit. So we'll see you there. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I don't want to interrupt good lunchtime conversation, but we're going to get started with the next uh, part of the program. And they're boosting the volume to help me out.
So I, I promised I promised a fire at this stop, and uh, the engine crew delivered. It's nice and warm up here in the front. It's definitely a nice respite uh, given the weather today. So I want to go ahead and get started with uh, the next uh, couple of topics that we've got planned for today. Uh, it's, it's good that we're able to take a little refuge here in the warm building uh, before we head back out on the last leg of our journey. Um, so speaking of the journey, we started out this morning talking about suppression and uh, coordinating suppression within the wildland urban interface. And then on our way to the next stop, we toured through a subdivision um, that is really ahead of its time in terms of uh, being built for wildfire resilience. And at the last stop, um, we had an opportunity to start to talk about some of the different tools that we have in the toolbox for all the mitigation work that we do. And uh, one of the things that strikes me uh, through the conversation today is that we're really talking about a lot of collaboration and coordination and good communications, whether we're talking about fire suppression, working together to make mitigation possible, um, and as the conversation continues here today, looking at a couple more uh, tools in that toolbox as we talk through the Federal Forest Restoration Program and shared stewardship. Um, also, you know, really rely on uh, good coordination and, and communication. And the same will be true at the last leg of the journey today when we talk about post-fire restoration. So that's kind of where we've been, uh, where we're headed, and uh, what we're going to discuss here at this stop. We've got about 30, 30 40 minutes or so for discussion and, and Q&A. Uh, we'll follow the same pattern, have the panel up, um, and then we'll pass the mic around uh, for the, the Q&A piece. I will ask the panel members uh, to please come forward at the end so that everybody's up here and we can use this mic for the answers and uh, the wireless for the questions. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Ryan Miller. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, real quick recap. So my name is Ryan Miller. And my day job, as we all are hearing people in different roles and responsibilities right now, is the FFR coordinator for the Central Oregon District. And so kind of putting on that Central Oregon hat at this point and uh, going to talk a little bit about what FFR, the Federal Forest Restoration Program, is doing here in Central Oregon. And, um, and then go down that route and we'll, we'll get some uh, higher level uh, discussions on FFR from other folks here. So. Um, a couple of key points that I wanted to make is um, locally here, the FFR program, um, you know, the, one of the main tools within that program is GNA, so Good Neighbor Authority. A lot of times those two terms are kind of intermingled and we're doing GNA and we're doing FFR, what are we doing? And I just wanted to clarify that the way I look at it is Good Neighbor Authority is a tool within the FFR program to accomplish good work on our, our partner's land. And so um, it's, it is just that. We are, we are an asset, we're a resource to help our, our federal partners accomplish work. Um, and I want to, I always like to say that, you know, we're helping them accomplish their goals at an increasing pace and scale as we talk about um, kind of from that perspective. So good neighbor authority being a tool within the FFR program. And then we kind of transition into what's next. And we heard a lot about what's happening, um, all the good work around here, cross-boundary restoration work and how we're breaking down barriers and how there are still some barriers out there. Um, GNA is a tool within FFR. FFR is a tool for us within shared stewardship. And that shared stewardship is kind of like this, this, buzz, this buzzword, right? But it means something here. And I think it's, uh, it, means, it means a lot. And you're seeing a lot of shared stewardship happening right now. Um, a couple of things on shared stewardship that I wanted to highlight is, and I think it, I think it's pretty unique. Um, as the FFR coordinator here in COD, I worked with a lot of different collaborative groups: the Deschutes, the Ochico, the Hood, the Mount here. And um, working with the Deschutes and the Ochico, along with um, NRCS folks and the Central Oregon Forest Stewardship Foundation, we kind of had this idea of 
we need to move off just federal land. We need to incorporate these programs. And so uh, there was a, about a core group of four or five of us that got together and figured out that shared stewardship was really kind of the next logical uh, place to go. And uh, so we worked through that in the time of COVID, which is really challenging to start a group of collaborative efforts and shared stewardship uh, on Zoom, but we did that. And the very first um, workshop that we had around shared stewardship, we had Peter Doherty speaking there. We had the regional forester speaking there. We had a lot of good support. And I was really, really proud to say that um, that was also in alignment with the time that the e-board fund, uh, the funding, those, all that mechanism came about. And ODF provided via e-board the first funding that, that, that uh, supported the shared stewardship effort here in Central Oregon. So it's not, and we're certainly not taking all the credit, but I think it's a pretty cool progression from good neighbor authority. We're gonna accomplish a, restor, a, re, a restoration activity on federal land to, hey, we're actually gonna be partners and we're gonna progress and we're gonna, we're gonna back that up with funding and really support shared stewardship. So um, just a little context here locally. And then that shared stewardship group, and you've heard about it today, is the same group that now is the recipient of the single largest landscape restoration grant. And so we go from GNA, shared stewardship, to now we're getting work done as a group, uh, cross boundary, as you heard that, that uh, geography of that grant. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll touch on there is that's all because of relationships. And you can have all the programs you want, you can have all the, the meetings you want, really, and you've heard about it from the fire pr perspective, from the suppression perspective, but it's also, it, it ties in, and it's the reason that we were successful with shared stewardship, and the reason that we were able to, to plow through getting something started off the ground with the shared stewardship group here in Central Oregon. It's because we, we had a common mission, and we trusted each other, and um, I just, I can't understate the, the value of those relationships. And you've, you've heard that today, and I think it's a little bit unique um, but it's, it's how things are getting done. So I just wanted to kind of highlight those things and I will, I will pass the mic and I'll be happy to answer questions at the end. All right, thank you. Hi there, uh, just quick introduction. Nathan Beckman, uh, Strategic Planning Coordinator for um, Oregon Department of Forestry. Um, and uh, I'm in uh, the planning branch. Uh, we talked about the reorganization. We talked a lot of uh, aspects of this, but why am I here? Um, well, I'm here for the 20 year strategic plan. Um, new to ODF, new to the state, um, and, and, and really impressed all the work that's going on. So I'll just kind of give you uh, uh, what's been going on in the last six months. So I've been on for, for about six months. Um, and within the strategic plan, I was told, hey, you're gonna develop this 20 year strategic plan. Um, and the first thing I said is, what is the 20 year strategic plan? Um, so, uh, with that, all good strategic planning starts off with an environmental scan, right? What's going on? Where are we? Where do we need to go, et cetera? So, um, I'll just kind of give you my journey and then where we're going um, to help frame this up. So, with that, I ask the question, what is it, right? It's part of uh, Senate Bill 762, and I think I can say that I'm the first offspring of, of, of SB 762. So, here I am, um, and I'm really excited about the opportunity. Uh, the first thing I said is, what is it? And um, read through the language, and essentially what it says, I'm just going to read it to you. 20-year strategic plan that prioritizes restoration actions and geographies for wildfire risk reduction that can be used to direct federal, state, and private investments in a tangible way. All right, got it. Uh, what does that mean, right? What is this? How do we get there, et cetera? Um, so the first thing that I was told is, well, you need to look into the uh, shared stewardship MOU. Right? So I went to the Shared Stewardship MOU and started looking at that. And, and one of the first things I asked was, Shared Stewardship, is it, is it new or is this what we do? Right? So ask yourself that. And we've been talking about it a lot. Um, the other piece of it, this 20-year strategic plan, how do we do this? What is it? And really digging into this MOU that's, that's brilliant, right? And the way that this was set up. And let me just remind you of what it is, where it came from, et cetera. So 2019, the Shared Stewardship MOU uh, was signed. That was between... Uh, the state of Oregon, ODF, uh, U.S. Forest Service, and NRCS, um, all signed into it saying, hey, this is the MOU, and what is the purpose of it? Jointly determine at a statewide scale, do the right work in the right place at the right scale, and use all available tools. 
We're talking a lot about tools, we're talking about the right place, the right work, et cetera. Um, the other aspect of that too is, how do you develop this 20 year strategy? What do we do, how do we get there, what is it? Um, once again, I started digging in deeper and trying to understand, and then learned about the Governor's Wildfire Council. How did this all come about, et cetera? The 37 recommendations based on the three legs of the National Cohesive Wildland Fire Management Strategy. I'm sure you all know about, but once again, um, that's looking at fire adapted communities, looking at uh, safe and effective fire response, and resilient landscapes. Uh, and the way that, that stool is designed is you have the three legs, and if you take out one, the other two are really ineffective, the stool falls down. Um, so I think it's really important to look at uh, holistically all the different pieces of it. Um, so just wanted to point that out. And the other piece of it too is um, to create a 20 year strategic plan. How do you do that? And once again, just kind of what I was looking at was when I uh, asked about the job and accepted it, I, the first question I asked is, okay, so we develop a 20 year strategy, then what? What do we do? And the answer was, we're gonna implement it. And that's where I said, sign me up, let's do it. Because what we don't want is to develop another plan that we put on a shelf and we say, hey, we did it, we don't implement it. So I think it's really important to realize that how do we develop a strategy and how do we implement it? To me, that's, that's really important and that's really my number one goal in creating this strategy. So how do you do that was the question. And really looking into the MOU, there's five elements of what this is, all right? So the first one um, is a shared vision. I'm talking a lot about a shared vision. Um, that's one, one aspect. So what's the shared vision? How are we sharing this? How are we looking at it? And the second a aspect of it is a governance process. How are we operating? How are we working together, right? We can say we are, but how are we really aligning this? How are we working together, et cetera? And then the third piece of it is a 20 year strategic plan, right? We need a strategy. How are we gonna get there? What are we gonna do to get there? And that's where the, the 20 year strategy is gonna come in. And then the, the, there's the revised forest action plan. And the last piece is a monitoring and accountability program. Um, so in my head, how I think about it is, what's the vision, where are we going? How are we gonna operate? What's the strategy? Right? And then the question is, are we or are we not doing it? We need to track that. So we set a trajectory. We need to figure out, are we getting there? And if we're not, why? Right? What are we looking at? What do we need to change? What do we need? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So the main thing I want to point out here is the development of is a couple things. One of them is a lot of people are asking, what's the plan, et cetera. And I just want to express it's a process, right? Um, it's a way of looking at it. How are we going to get there? How are we going to work together, et cetera? Um, so I think that's really important to think about that. Um, and then um, the other aspect of it is alignment, right? Alignment to me is really important. Um, I'm gonna answer my question that hopefully y'all been thinking about. Um, shared stewardship, is it new or is it something we do? It's what we do. Um, I've seen it for the last couple hours. We talk about it, it's what we're doing. Um, so I think it's really important to recognize what we do. Okay, so um, really look at the alignment. And I think what I've seen in, in my short time is the misalignment in a lot of the work we do. Um, you have a lot of good work that's happening at the local level. You have a lot of good work that's happening at the state level and you have a lot of good work that's happening at the regional level and the national level. And the question is, is how do we align that? How do we use our resources? How do we start bringing that together? How do we have one vision, one strategy to create resilient landscapes? Um, so once again, um, where are we in that process? So um, six months environmental scan, figuring out, um, we're starting off with the, with the governance process. Um, something that's been really exciting is the uh, three state agencies and three uh, federal agencies coming together, okay? Um, Cal's doing great work, a strategic leadership group. Um, we have uh, uh, ODF, ODFW, uh, OWEB, US Forest Service, NRCS, BLM, B BIA, all coming together to talk about, hey, we gotta share this together, we gotta think about this and we gotta work together. Um, and that's the strategic leadership group. Um, the second aspect of it is we have an agency coordination and implementation group that's coming together as well. Um, the same agency's representation and trying to figure this out, saying we gotta work together, we gotta figure this out, and how do we support that work that's going on at the local level? Um, and I do apologize, I'm gonna run, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this to you and then ask any questions and get out of here, which I do apologize, but part of it is because that uh, agency coordination and implementation group, we have a meeting and we gotta keep going, right? Um, we got to keep that momentum. So we're going to go ahead and, and keep that conversation, which is really exciting. So from there, we're going to be developing the shared vision. Okay. And the other aspect of this too is how do we support the work that's going on, right? What, what are those needs? I've heard a lot of those needs. I've heard a lot about it. How do we start that information loop that's going up and down, um, bringing in the funding, uh, bringing in the capacity, um, looking at all the challenges we're facing? How do we start bringing this stuff together? Um, so the aspect of it is working with the partnerships, the collaboratives, et cetera. 
and, and bringing that all together, right, through um, different aspects. So trying to put together a process and structure team, which is going to be looking at the development of the strategy and how do we look at, at the different areas, how do we look at the local level to get that information, to have this 20-year strategy really supporting the localized strategy to implement resilient landscapes uh, into the future. So um, the last piece of it, I just want to express that what I really realized in my time here is um, there's a lot of good work going on. Um, it's, it's not that we, we're starting from the very beginning, there's a lot of good stuff. Um, how do we build off that? How do we keep going, et cetera? So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to talk about some of that great work that's going on. And like I said, I apologize, i got to run, but I think Ryan should be able to answer some questions as well. So thanks, Ryan. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Kyle Sullivan. I'm the Federal Forest Restoration Program Lead at ODF, um, based in Salem. And I think, you know, this conversation, um, and really I was gonna be just very brief and, and kind of summarize the, the program here at ODF that we've had since 2013. Um, but I think it was teed up well by, you know, this conversation around shared stewardship and also by looking at the West Bend project, one of the, you know, when we talk about landscape resilience, that's a perfect example of what we're talking about doing um, in, in these landscapes. Um, and I think FFR, Federal Forest Restoration Program, is probably one of the best examples we have of shared stewardship in, in action. Um, and so, you know, with that, I kind of wanted to back up, and I think a lot of you are probably aware of this already, but just for context, you know, of the 30 million acres of forest land within the state, 60% of which is under the jurisdiction of our, our federal counterparts, U.S. Forest Service or Bureau of Land Management. Um, and that number ticks up to 71% east of the Cascades. So over two thirds of our forests managed primarily by the U.S. Forest Service and BLM and under federal ownership. So that kind of sets the stage, I guess, for, for the importance of this, this state forestry agency doing work on federal lands you know, when we talk about our mission of protecting, managing, and promoting stewardship of Oregon's forests, right? That's Oregon's 30 million acres of forest. Um, and so uh, uh, with a significant portion of that being federal, so that's kind of the, the impetus, I guess, for our work in partnership, uh, key word, with our federal, uh, federal counterparts. Um, but the mission uh, which, of this program, which I think is a good one, um, it is to increase the pace, scale, and quality of the restoration work happening on those federal lands. Um, and, and what does that really mean? I mean, that means, you know, achieving that landscape resilience, but it's also in, in non-wildfire prone areas, creating fish and, habit, uh, fish and wildlife habitat, um, restoring watershed function, and creating employment opportunities for our forest-dependent rural communities. That's a, that's a, those are the, kind of the core pillars of this, this work and this program. So how do we achieve that increasing pay scale and quality? And so this is, if there's you know, three things that you take away from this presentation, and this is kind of what the FFR program does. It you know, partners and adds capacity to our federal counterparts by doing both commercial and non-commercial work. So what do we mean by that? We mean you know, actually going in and doing the thinning that we just saw, and, and you know, whether it's a commercial or, uh, or non-commercial restoration treatment, but doing those and adding that capacity to achieve it at, at the scale commensurate with the need out there. Um, and also doing it in a, in a science-based, you know, ecologically sound uh, way that's taking these forests and, and you know, adapting them to this you know, changing climatic uh, uh, patterns that we have. The second thing, so you know, adding, adding capacity to implementation, the second thing that this program does is it really invests in the NEPA process, the planning to get those projects through the, the planning process, which is a long and, and uh, at times, you know, it's a long process and it's costly for our federal agencies. So investing in the National Environmental Policy Act planning process um, is something this program has done since its inception in 2013. <laughs> and it's a big bottleneck. You'll talk with Holly and, and others from the forest that it's, you know, it's a really limiting factor for getting the restoration work needed, uh, you know, getting it done on the ground. Um, and then the third piece of the program really is, you know, supporting and partnering with our forest collaboratives, um, recognizing that, you know, we need to build, that main, build and maintain the trust necessary to go out and do the good work that's happening on the ground uh, and, and really achieving that social license that we all talk about. Um, 
and that's you know one of the primary ways ways in doing that. And this this federal forest restoration program is the sole financial supporter now of these forest these 20 plus forest collaborators in the state. So it's it's kind of a vital piece of the forest restoration puzzle um, when you look out um, across the landscape. Um, and so a couple, and so that was kind of like the quick rundown on the FFR program and just a couple sort of parting thoughts, I guess. Um, you know, when, when Mike was kind of kicking us off talking about the Aubrey Hall fire and, you know, how 20, 30 years ago we learned, like, you know, in the fire context, we need to work together as agencies and, and you know, to fight these fires. I think we're perhaps at a, at a point where we're really at the, the same sort of time to work proactively across agencies, but doing it in the proactive side, uh, on the on the forest management side, and that's probably you know uh, you know in line with this shared stewardship uh, concept. Um, and then, so the final thing I just want to point out: it, this is a good investment. The the FFR program, because it's able to harness you know these federal dollars, the 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 not, you know the commercial value from these thinnings. It's, you know, it's a really good investment to get these landscape uh, treatments done at scale. And, you know, so in our next fiscal year, we're projected to do 31,000 acres of treatments. And that's going to come at a cost of all-in cost of the general fund, about $2.5 million. So that's that's pretty significant amount of acreage for a relatively small investment of the state general fund. And so I think that that's um, something, you know, a real benefit when we talk landscape resiliency but one of the key, most cost-effective ways of getting it done is, is through our federal forest restoration work, using that good neighbor authority as the tool to get that work done. So um, with that, I will um, hand it off to Phil Chang, uh, Deschutes County Commissioner and co-chair of the Deschutes Forest Collaborative Project. Okay, I, uh, when I first heard about this panel, I thought I was going to be the last person in between you and lunch. So I'm really glad that I'm, that's not what I've got to do, but I, I see that I, I have to deal with food coma now. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll try to keep my comments fairly brief. I'm going to touch on a whole bunch of themes that you've already talked about today. And um, I, 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 by way of introduction, I... I do have those uh, two identities, that, those two hats that, that, that Kyle just mentioned. Um, I am one of three Deschutes County Commissioners, uh, just elected in uh, November 2020. Uh, I am uh, a member and a co-chair of the steering committee for the Deschutes Collaborative Forest Project. And my, the third hat I, I can claim is as a former ODF staffer um, with the Federal Forest Restoration Program. Um, so a couple of different, I have some different perspectives on the issues that we're talking about today. And I really briefly just want to say, you know, explain uh, why the Deschutes National Forest is uh, so important to my community, um, why the uh, Deschutes Collaborative Forest Project, why this, this forest collaborative is so important um, to the management of the Deschutes National Forest. And then the third thing I want to hit on, which you heard a little bit um, from Kyle about, is um, what we need, what, uh, what this forest collaborative needs from the Federal Forest Restoration Program, from ODF, from the state of Oregon to, to do our work. Um, so the, the reasons for, uh, the reasons that this national forest is so important to my community You've, you've heard a number of these themes already today, but just to kind of recap them. Um, number one, first and foremost, at this point in, in the history of this community, uh, we need this forest not to deliver high severity fire to our doorsteps. Um, Holly gave that statistic of, you know, there's 300,000 acres within a mile of a, a home uh, in, in, um, for the Deschutes National Forest. I wish I had the the flip statistic of, you know, this is how many homes are within one mile of the boundary of the Deschutes National Forest because um, it is thousands and thousands. Uh, and that does make this forest unique uh, among national forests in the, in the state of Oregon, the, the amount of 
wildland urban interface and the amount of federal land that is right up, literally right up against um, the back doors of uh, residents of this community. Uh, so we, uh, community wildfire protection is a huge concern um, for the Deschutes National Forest. The forest is also a major economic driver for my community. Um, that is, there's a long history of that going back to people working in the woods, uh, people uh, producing forest products from the materials that we can sustainably um, harvest from the national forest. And, and that, that thread continues. Um, but the forest is also a huge economic driver because of the recreational asset that it provides to this community. <laughs> Not only does uh, you know, hundreds of miles of trails within, um, within the West Bend project um, not only is that a major uh, tourism driver for us, but um, those recreational assets are literally the reason that uh, many, many people uh, pick up their family, pick up their business, and relocate to Deschutes County. So it, uh, a, a major uh, component of the, the, the wealth and you know, um, human capital that we have in this community uh, is here because of that forest. Uh, and then third, uh, the, the, the forest represents all sorts of natural resource values that we're all familiar with. It's uh, you know, important fish and wildlife habitat. Uh, the municipal watershed for the city of Bend sits smack dab in the middle of the Deschutes National Forest. Many other ecosystem and, and um, natural resource values. So. That is why uh, we have all of these people who are interested in coming together uh, in, the, in this forest collaborative uh, to work on promoting the kind of forest management that we need in this community. Um, and why this collaborative is important, I, I would say it, it, it does three things for us. It uh, creates social license. It uh, brings resources here that wouldn't otherwise be here. Um, and uh, uh, the, the collaborative helps us deal with bottlenecks uh, to, the, to the process of active restoration that um, stand in our way. Um, I, I'll start with talking about social license. The, you, you, heard, you heard Kevin say that uh, the West Bend project Started with the the acres that were right next to the right next to the the urban growth boundary for the city, uh, shock and awe. Um, the uh, another aspect, another facet of that of of shock and awe is that um, it took a really long time for the city of Bend to get to planning. Uh, it, sorry, it took a very long time for the Deschutes National Forest to get to planning the West Bend project. You heard this morning how the Aubrey Hall fire started in you know 30 years ago, um, and then you heard that the West Bend project NEPA was only completed in 2013. So, um, I would argue that part of the reason it took so long for that to happen is because uh, planning and implementing a project like that, uh, when you have 100,000 neighbors <laughs> of the of the national forest. Um, is uh, it's, it's a really daunting, uh, it's a daunting task. And without uh, broad support from a, a huge range of stakeholders uh, engaging with your community, you cannot successfully complete that NEPA planning process for that project. Uh, and that is one of the things that uh, this Deschutes Collaborative Forest Project, this group, this stakeholder group, delivered, uh, you know, right around that, that period, you know, the early 2000s for this forest. Uh, not only did we bring together a whole range of stakeholders, timber, environmentalists, recreationists, firefighters, uh, municipal water utilities, not only did we bring those people together and, and help them figure out what they could agree on, we also uh, then turned around and took that shared vision and sold it to the community. Um, so that when uh, we started uh, seeing implementation of the West Bend project, um, people were ready 
for their favorite trail, uh, their favorite trail to be shut down for two months. People were ready um, to see prescribed fire in their backyard. Um, people were ready to uh, accept inconveniences, uh, accept uh, really dramatic visual changes in the forest that they uh, they know and love so well, because they understood why it was needed and where we were trying to get the forest to. So the social license uh, piece is, is, is incredibly important. Um, when you bring all those people together and they, and they can agree and they've got a shared vision and you can start to see some successes on the ground, it also brings resources uh, to, to, to your community. We're seeing it right now with um, various kinds of resources that could come to this community through SB 762. And we saw it back in 2009 when uh, this community was uh, one of 10 in the nation to success successfully com compete um, for the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program, which brought $10 million of supplemental funding over a 10-year period right here to implement uh, tens of thousands of additional acres of, of treatments. So having that collaborative, having that ag agreement, um, and having that forward momentum brings additional resources. And uh, you know, we all know that there are not enough resources to, to, to accomplish the work that uh, needs to be done out there. Who knows, maybe now with SB 762 and with the infrastructure bill, we're a lot closer to having enough resources to get the work done. But you know, I'd also argue that we wouldn't see the $40 million investment from the infrastructure bill on the Deschutes National Forest without the history of success that we've had so far. Um, bottlenecks, I, just to kind of touch back on one of the issues that was raised this morning, uh, this community uh, pushed very hard with the st Smoke Management Advisory Committee for flexibility to put a little bit more smoke during some key hours into the air in this community. Um, we got some additional flexibility. I, 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 as I mentioned this morning, I feel like we're, we're backsliding a little bit with um, uh, DEQ and other entities uh, locally right now, and, and hopefully we can get some get some help from uh, uh, some, of our, uh, some of our partners and friends here uh, in, in making, uh, in overcoming those issues. Uh, but those are the kinds of bottlenecks that we perceived to the work that we want to do um, and that we tried to tackle head on. Uh, Pete Caligiri, who's, who's here, he can, he can tell you in detail about um, the policy work um, that has been put in on behalf of this community on that particular issue, and, and, there, are, and there are others. So the, that's some of the things that a collaborative does for this community, and now I'd just like to mention, in terms of what we need, what a collaborative like that needs from the Federal Forest Restoration Program and ODF, um, you heard from Kyle about a number of the programs that, um, that ODF, uh, through the Federal Forest Restoration Program, offers. Uh, to me, the most important ones for the collaborative are uh, those collaborative capacity grants um, that OWEB helps to uh, helps to offer um, to uh, communities around the state, um, the technical assistance and science support uh, grants that um, that are, are come out through the Federal Forest Restoration Program, basically to help us answer the really hard questions that we need to answer, so that we can keep all of those stakeholders working together. Um, and then there, there's other ways that the Feral Forest Restoration Program helps us build capacity at the local level. Uh, Kyle mentioned a couple of them. But, you know, the two that I would mention are um, funds that the Feral Forest Restoration Program invests in data collection and analysis that allows the Forest Service to get more NEPA done. Um, that that gets us to more acres that are implementation ready where we can invest money, money into, uh, you know, when, when those monies, those implementation dollars become available. And Good Neighbor Authority is, is a really useful tool for expanding capacity to implement work on the National Forest as well. So those, those are just a couple of, um, those are 
a, a few of the particular ways that the Federal Forest Restoration Program is helping us get work done here. And um, I'd be happy to answer any questions too. I think I'm the last. The, uh, uh, and I forget his name already, Nathan, Nathan the 20-year strategic yeah. plan. Is that, going back to the meeting we had yesterday, right, reviewing the POPs uh, for the agency and, and what sticks from 762 in the next biennium, is Nathan's position part of CSL or is that part of that, part of that ask the agency's gonna have to, gonna have to make? Uh, sorry, I thought I was getting a signal. It's a signal for behind me. Uh, so uh, Nathan's position was, is a permanent position uh, that we received with 762, so we don't have to go back and ask for it um, again. It will continue. I thought you were gonna ask a really hard question. Hey, hey Ryan. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so I've been really engaged with Nathan on the 20-year strategic plan work, and just a, a question there. I mean, you know, Nathan talked about the work that the department's doing with federal and, and other state uh, agencies, and then kind of this lower-level implementation team, kind of the, the people within those agencies that are the real doers, maybe not the people that are creating that shared vision, but the actual doers. So when in the process do stakeholders get engaged? because we've seen it time and time again that the agencies and, and public agencies try to create solutions without the industry, without stakeholders, and then they aren't durable for the future. So when are, when are the folks in the room gonna be engaged in that process? Yeah, and I really appreciate that question because it's something that I know is on a lot of folks' mind and I, and I, I want to address it. Um, so the way I would characterize the work that's going on right now is it's really an opportunity for the uh, state and federal agencies that are involved in this work to get court at that statewide level um, and really kind of get our house in order, if you will. And I think that's really important um, to kind of set the stage so that when we do go out and begin to uh, engage other stakeholders, um, we've got a good solid foundation to build on. And so that that is that's coming. Um, Nathan asked me if he should brought in a bunch of uh, printouts that he's got. So if you, have, if you go into his office, uh, he actually doesn't have an office. He actually works in the, the resource planning library, which is a large space. He's got posters and things all over the walls, all kinds of diagrams and different, different ideas. Um, and uh, there is a kind of a complex model that, that, that exists for sort of what this uh, governance structure that he referred to looks like. He asked me if he should bring it here today and show it, and I said, no, I don't think that we wanna go, that, that, that sounds like it would get kind of confusing. Um, but in, in any case, my point is that there are sort of a bunch of different concentric circles, um, and stakeholder engagement is one of those circles that we are beginning to build. Um, and in fact, we had some conversation at the last meeting of that implementation group, the kind of the doers group that you were referring to, and um, really want to think creatively about how we engage different stakeholders in this work, uh, recognizing that, you know, we, there's a lot of folks we want to have at the table, but the table can't be that big because it becomes then very challenging to make progress and get things done. And so we're looking to OWEB and a few other um, agencies uh, within that group who have some experience in doing stakeholder engagement in some different ways. And, and so we're, we're trying to examine some different models to make it possible to bring the broadest number of voices we can into the discussion while still keeping it manageable um, and, and helping us to move forward productively. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, it is a process. It's, it's not a product. I think a lot of folks are, you know, really expecting a bound piece of paper at the end of the day, and certainly that will be the case, but I think the most useful and durable parts of it will be the processes and the relationships that are built to help to sustain the continued investment in the work that's going on on the ground. That's kind of how I've been framing it up in my head. Please.
Hopefully this isn't a question for Nathan, because... Yeah, I, no, 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 oh, I good. don't think it, it might be a question for Holly, though. <laughs> so, praise yourself, Holly. <laughs> Um, so, um, Phil talked about, uh, just so interesting, the smoke management piece and how y'all had to navigate and trying to open up that window um, as, you know, as a, as a bottleneck in this whole really cool restoration project. And I just um, process. And so I was asked, thinking about that, Holly, and my old planning mind is kind of, you know, getting itself dusted off, is that, what are you doing in the NEPA process that is allowing you to move forward on these projects? And what still would be helpful um, to increase the pace as 762 um, is available, as infrastructure is available? Because I do know that it has been another bottleneck in the process. So can you speak to that? So thanks for that question. I, I think for me, when, when I think about the planning process and the Forest Service, um, we certainly have our hurdles and bumps. And as Commissioner Chang shared, I think some of the opportunities we've had with Good Neighbor Authority and the Federal Forest Restoration Program have helped us a lot. Because it's, um, I always call it when we talk about um, bringing resources to a fire incident, what we can bring together what, what's the best that we can all bring as agencies together? And oftentimes, like trying to do contracts for surveys in the Forest Service, we have these really tight windows to get contracts out. And if we miss that window, we can go to a partner agency and they don't have that same window. So that's some of the success that we have with trying to bring the best of what we have to bear together. And that's what's been really helpful having these different funding options and streams is when we hit a barrier, um, can we go to our partners and ask how do we how do we get past that and how does that help us be more successful through time? And I think again as Phil shared about the collaborative that's been incredibly important You know, I worked on the Deschutes as a district ranger 12 plus years ago And it was a way different environment right when we were going through the environmental analysis and public comment um, It's not perfect in, We're not always going to agree even in a collaborative world, but it's a lot smoother than it was 12 years ago when it felt like every decision was in court and that puts us on a, on a big time delay um, to implement projects. So that's a little bit of what I would share to a pretty complex question. Other questions or discussion? Yeah. Thanks. I'm Eric Fernandez with Oregon Wild. Um, I, I think we've heard a lot today about the Deschutes Forest Collaborative and uh, all of the, the need for pace and scale and the, the need for trust um, and social license. And I, I would just, just note for the, the good of the order today, there's, there's another narrative on how things are going on the Deschutes right now. It's not quite as kumbaya as I think we've heard today. There's a lot of conservation concerns about how projects are being implemented and the end results some trail user concerns. We've got breweries taking out full page ads expressing concerns. So there's there's a lot of potential common ground, but there's also things not trending in the right direction. So just wanted to put it out there. We, we could spend three hours talking about why or how or all the mechanics of that. But uh, just so folks know, there's it's not total kumbaya at the moment here on the Deschutes. So more of a comment than a question. Any other questions or discussion? Yeah. Hi, uh, Pete Calagiri again. I'm the Forest Strategy Director for the Nature Conservancy here in Oregon. I guess, you know, I, I recognize there's a lot of these uh, intersecting um, interests and streams coming our way in terms of supporting this kind of work on federal, fed, federal land between IIJA, between elements of Senate, Senate Bill 762 and the FFRP program. I'd just be curious for thoughts within ODF. When, when I hear and see, for example, the, the Forest Service's 10-year wildfire crisis strategy really emphasizing a recognition for and a need for a, a significant paradigm shift in how we're approaching 
landscape resilience and wildfire risk reduction. And when I think about uh, what a paradigm shift is, that's not just simply adding more money to business as usual. Business as usual hasn't been working for us. I think that's what we've been talking about a lot today. So I'd be curious thoughts from within ODF, either staff or leadership or the board, uh, about what does ODF think that that paradigm shift looks like that's needed internal to their structure, your organization, to actually not only just add more money, but to significantly, fundamentally sh change how we're doing business on the ground. So I can, I can offer a couple of thoughts maybe through the lens of um, the 20 year strategy, but I certainly want to allow space for others uh, either on the board or within the agency to offer some perspective as well. So I'll buy you some time to think for a minute, um, hopefully successfully. Um, so, uh, you know, putting this, putting your question in the lens of the, the 20 year strategy, you know, I think I see an opportunity there um, with that process and with that plan um, to think about where, where do we need to make investments in places where we haven't uh, necessarily made investments before. Um, so it could be some of the things that we've talked about on this, on this uh, tour in our time together, you know, workforce, looking at Amanda, you know, workforce could be one of those areas where there's, um, you know, a need for more investment. Uh, we've talked a lot about social um, capacity, um, collaborative capacity, you know, looking at the landscape um, oftentimes we think about where we want to place treatments based on where there's the most fuels that need to be reduced, but there are a lot of other variables uh, to consider as well. And overlaying some of those variables along with kind of community readiness and, and social capacity I think is really valuable uh, because that helps us to also think about, okay, if we, if we know that the fuel models say we should invest here, but there's not the social capital, there's not that capacity that's there, then we should be making some advanced investments in building that capacity. Um, I, I also, you know, think of these collaborative efforts, I think about kind of the care and feeding of the people uh, and the institutions that are involved, and that's a place where we don't traditionally make a lot of investments. Uh, if, you, if you look at a lot of these successful projects, um, it's, it's usually because of one individual or two individuals, and obviously it, it takes a group, but one person who kind of gives that extra time within their job at an agency or an NGO um, that really helped to make them successful. And we don't necessarily recognize that and invest in that. I think that's important. Um, I also think that we have a lot of uh, work to do in terms of collecting data, you know, and telling our story um, and doing that uh, not just within our agencies but across our agencies. Um, that's really important not only to attract additional investment, but to feed into decision support tools that help us to decide uh, where we should invest next and when we've made enough investment in one particular area. So those are, I don't know, some ideas that are floating around in my head. I hope that the 20-year strategy process will help to daylight some more of those um, as well as some strategies to address them. Uh, so, okay, that was, I don't know, three or four minutes. Uh, anybody have any other ideas they want to put on the table? You, you know, it's really great when you got people like Ryan uh, working for you because he just kind of covers it all. But there, I just wanted to add another area that we want to be looking at as we look at these, uh, you know, these resiliency programs is how do you make them sustainable? You know, that's always the thing. And one of the ideas that we've been tossing around is looking at areas that you can start developing infrastructure or support infrastructure to bring it in that will continue to allow this to be sustainable. Um, you know, the thing that keeps me up about these things is I, I'm just really impressed where the collaboration and stuff is going on in Deschutes counties. But, uh, you know, it's uh, it, it, what uh, workforce is something that really is, keeps me up about this is that, you know, we're having a lot of problems just getting regular stuff done. And now we're talking about expanding these programs on very large scale. And so, you know, there's going to be a focus. I think we do have to focus on ha working on that workforce issue. And then vulnerable communities. I think you touched on it with DEI and so on. Uh, vulnerable communities, I think we need to be looking at that. I know that when that uh, Aubrey Hall fire came over and it jumped over into the Deschutes River woods, 
those people, that back then, it's not like that now if you go over there, but back then there was a lot of people who were economically vulnerable. And I don't think that ever really came back. And so the, we're going to have to make sure that we have that in our considerations. Finally, I think we had an April 6 workshop, and it was really focused on hearing the voices, the voices in my head, no, hearing the voices of, uh, you know, that we don't normally get to t reach out to. And I think we learned a lot because of that. And I think that's a, that's a leadership thing that we need to continue to make sure that we're reaching out to communities and groups of people that don't normally get to come and participate in these events. When I was chairing the Metolius multi-party monitoring team, I love that big thing, uh, I did that for eight years. And I would have to say we only had really one person from a very vulnerable community that actually attended. He actually lived in the forest and would show up to our collaborative meetings. Uh, I, I shouldn't say too much more. <laughs> the boss is here. No, <laughs> no, but he would, because we served lunch. You know, it was really a community route thing. We would be at the Sisters Ranger District, and he would show up, and he actually did contribute a lot uh, perspective from that, you know, that avenue. And I remember being working late at night, and he would call me up, and he would say things like, I bet you're in front of your computer. And I would go, yeah, you're right. And uh, he says, I'm looking at the stars on a landing on the Sisters Ranger District. I mean, different perspective. But, the, you know, he did bring a valuable perspective. And that's something that we didn't have. We had people that were either retired or were very, or were in the profession working, you know, with an NGO or the, you know, even we didn't even have a lot of contractors that came out on a regular basis because they had to be out there cutting trees, making a living. So these are all considerations I think we're going to have to be making as we move forward. But Ryan, you're doing a great job, so thanks. Um, real quick. Um, I appreciate a lot of the, the comments, and Pete, I'm, it's food for thought, your question. Um, and... I think about scale. We need to scale this, and I'm going to echo um, Carla Chambers, who's not here today. Um, and there's a lot more work to do, and we're just scratching the surface. And I think I've heard today, I've heard two competing narratives of all the really awesome partnerships and collaborations and ways we're building things, and also all the reasons why the acres are still a, a fraction of what they need to be. And so I think there's, there's exciting groundwork being laid. And for me, at least, I've learned a lot of little bottlenecks that hopefully there's policy solutions for that I think we can all work on. So I, that's not an answer, but that's what's going on in my head right now. Thanks, Ben. Um, Pete, you talked about paradigm shift. And I think there's paradigm shifts in structure, but there's also you know, maybe one of the hardest ones is our paradigm shift in our thinking. And so, um, you know, many of us, you know, just logically, because it's easier, think in a linear time frame. But, you know, the discussion about climate change and about carbon is all about cycles. And so when you have cycles, you have ebb and flow. And so in the human main mind, and maybe these breweries in, in Bend, which are important, you know, don't want to see smoke, and, um, and so it becomes cumulative for them. But if we start thinking in that cycle of carbon and the life cycle um, and what climate change is bringing us, um, I think one of the hardest jobs is, was it Jody who is living with fire? Is she here? Anyway, oh, there you are. And I mean, I almost think that's one of the hardest things to do because it's making our human mind say, this isn't a one and done. This is something that is going to keep going. And for, uh, for I think, humans who have moved away from farming and forestry and the land, we forget about these cycles because we are pretty insulated. We can go anywhere. We can get on a plane if it's winter, and we can go to the Caribbean. So we can break that cycle that we have so much control over, but we can't break this. So I think that's probably the biggest, um, you know, I think paradigm shift is our own mental. And so, like Ben said, you know, Carla, who's also um, a member, talks about scaling up. I think we just have to break our thinking of what is um, a time frame 
and really think about cycles. So that's my biggest paradigm shift that I have to make for myself. So we are getting a little close on time. You got some thoughts? Yep. I'll just uh, maybe finish on a, a quick, maybe reflective comment about the paradigm shift um, question, Pete. And there's there's the implementation paradigm shift. There's the planning paradigm shift. Um, and I would just say, looking back over the, the last three or four years that I've been involved with FFR, you know, some of the the paradigm shift that's already happened is cultural within the agencies. And I think that's noteworthy. Um, you know, I've heard ODF wants to take over management of federal forest. When I talk about federal forest restoration program, that's clearly not the case, but that was some of the feedback we got early on. Or from the ODF side, oh, this is just state forest light. You know, this is gonna be a new branch of state forest. Also, not where we're going with this. But those were, those were indicators of a culture that wasn't ready to fully embrace and fully adopt, like use the tools. And so I think um, just reflecting back on that as this conversation evolved, I think it's important to note, we're maybe not there yet, but the cultural shifts within the agency are now allowing us to really talk seriously about using these tools um, that we've all, we've all just heard about and, and talked about and we know about. So um, for what it's worth, I just wanted to share that We've come a long ways in the really recent past, um, and I think we have we have a little ways to go, but we're we're starting that paradigm shift for sure. I'll um, probably sound like I'm a little soft in the head, but I think when we talk about bringing. Um, this work up to scale, as Ben was t talking about, that's so important and so key. We we really need to, uh, to be making the political argument, particularly with our federal elected officials, that this is we have an opportunity here not just to save these forests, but also to save communities and to save people, because essentially most of this money that we're going to need to do this is going to have to come out of the federal government, and it's mostly going to be all about creating jobs. And right now, you know, because of what's happening in communities like where I live in Grant County and John Day, where we've had, uh, you know, mills shut down a long, long time ago and we have widespread, you know, dysfunction, uh, drug addiction, uh, people who are on disability, other programs. And you know, how do they, how do they stay alive? Uh, mostly through various federal programs as in disability, food stamps, et cetera, et cetera. We are already supporting a ton of people in these dysfunctional lives and dysfunctional communities. And the more we can go into those communities, put those people to work at scale, it's really, is there, is there I'm not convinced that there's an additional cost to do this. Um, uh, or at least it's not nearly as significant as it might be if you think about that trade-off. Anyhow. All right. I guess we're done, right? Yeah. Almost uh, 2 o'clock straight up, which was the plan. Uh, so ask everybody to please uh, make their way towards their mode of transportation, and we will move on to the last stop, which will focus on post-fire restoration. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon. And again, this is Josh Bernard. I'm the Interim Forest Resources Division Chief. And today we are at Tour Stop 4, and we're going to talk about fire restoration. So we'll talk about uh, forest landowner impacts and challenges of post-fire restoration and recovery and discuss what is needed to support landowners in post-fire recovery. Uh, statewide and local perspectives will be shared today. Uh, joining us for the conversation will be uh, Chris Johnson of Shanda Assets. Uh, we have ODF Central Oregon District Protection Supervisor Chase Duncan and ODF Family Forest Land Coordinator Nate Agelsoff. And just a couple comments uh, before we start. Um, from my perspective, post-fire restoration is kind of like the secondary response after fire. Usually follows fire season and uh, when there are significant impacts to private landowners, then the, in our work in the Forest Resources Division, there's usually a second wave of work that follows that into the fall rains as uh, fire season wraps up. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris, uh, 
let him take it away here. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming out here. Uh, at least it's not snowing yet. So uh, um, just a brief history on where we're at here. Um, this is a portion of the Two Bulls fire that started in uh, June of 2014. Um, I was not working for this company at the time. I was at a graduation party. I was pretty well lit when uh, I saw the smoke from this guy's backyard and I thought, oh shit, that's not good. Um, so at any rate, that's how that happened. And uh, shortly after this burned, I did actually start working for the company at the time, a different one. But uh, we were able to salvage it relatively quickly. Um, like I said, burned first part of June. By the end of uh, August, we had done all our salvage logging and we got what we could out of here. Um, tough decision I had to make was, do I just turn my back on this and let it just fall apart? Or do I try to get some value out, it, out of it and use that value to try to get some trees growing back here again? <clears throat> we lost about 10 to 12 million feet a standing timber here. We'd spent a lot of time grooming this area with a lot of intermediate thinning work. It was set to grow really well, and it was growing well, and it was a shame to lose as much as we did. Um, after the fire, I contacted a number of nurseries to try to get seedlings, and I could not get any seedling space because we're very infrequent buyers of seedlings. We typically don't have to buy seedlings for planting work since our harvesting regime doesn't require that. Um, so we were not able to get trees actually into the ground until the spring of 2016. And at that, we could only get half of the seedlings that we needed for the project. So we finished the rest of it the spring of 2017. Um, as you can look around, you don't see nice four or five foot tall seedlings poking up through the brush. Um, we've had a very poor response uh, with our seedlings. Uh, they were good seedlings, proper seed zone, all that kind of good stuff, but they did not take due to, it's a pretty droughty, low site area. Uh, we've had drought, et cetera, and therefore we uh, have had a poor uh, response for our seedlings. Um, what was I gonna say? Bear with me. We, at the time, and still to this day, uh, did not have the funds available to spray for veg control, given the fact that when I sold the logs to the mill, the only, only mill that would take the small pine is in Gilchrist. Um, the log buyers that they are, I understand, they hit the gouge button and offered us next to nothing for our logs, knowing that our back was to the wall. And so we just had to take our... Uh, it wasn't a loss, but it was very close to it. Um, at least reek out, leak out some money from it. Um, and that's, of course, you maybe heard earlier that that's one of the biggest problems we face is a very non-competitive market for saw logs and therefore depressed prices. But we took the money that we made and we did what we could. We gave it our best shot, and unfortunately it didn't work out very well. Um, prior planting experiences out here, North of here, in about 1990 or 91, uh, there was the delicious burn. It burned up about 2,000 acres, 1,000 acres of which was on private. Uh, we planted that area three times. And still to this day has been very unsuccessful. After all that work, most of that ground got traded off to the Forest Service in about 1990 or 99 or 2000. So it's not our problem anymore. But it is a super tough site to reforest, and um, we're just up against it. Um, we've done the best we can out here, <clears throat> but uh, reforestation is a tough show. Um, that's, that's kind of the story behind it. Uh, are there any questions, concerns from the group? hasn't been successful out here. I mean, so what is now happening out here? Well, we have good views. 
and we've got a hot spot for mule deer. Fish and wildlife likes it. Um, that part's good, but uh, uh, I'd be much better off growing condominiums out here than trees. So. Yeah. How many acres like this? The burn on us was uh, 6,000 acres, 1,000 on the feds. And, and is, was there any amount that was successful in reforestation? I assume you, you reforested the whole 6,000 acres mm. on, on your property, and mm. there was maybe some success somewhere? Is there, what, what's your thoughts there? Yeah, good question. We, there are pockets, and when I say pockets, five to ten acre patches here and there. Don't know why they survived as well as they did, um, but yeah, there are pockets, but that's it. Sorry, I'm digging deep, and you know you can tell me to shut up anytime you want. Sure. Uh, so, you know, 6,000 acres, uh, what sort of cost per acre are you looking at for reforestation that you had to invest in here that for all intents and purposes, is now um, largely failed. <clears throat> Let me think here. Uh, it was about 250 an acre. Mm -hmm. Yep. Seedlings and labor and, and all that. And a little bit more, but uh, for overhead and extra work and all that. Yep. So it's tough. I mean, you carry that cost for 80 years, more or less, which would be a financially mature tree for us. And uh, we'll never reap that kind of money when we harvest again. Well, yeah, I, I'd maybe even take it a step further. That's a lot to invest and carry for 80 years if you were going to get something, but you're not going to get anything in 80 years, Correct. right? Oh, yeah. So you invested that money, mm -hmm. and now there's no end end state, really, on Correct. this piece of real estate. Yep, yep. Uh, Chris, thanks for sharing. It sounds like a terrible story to live with. They, uh, I was curious, what kind of viability do you have for livestock grazing? Is that even an option? We certainly could could do that. Um, again, it's uh, making an investment in a lot of fence and gates. Um, don't think it's really worth it, but it's an idea. Um, currently... This uh, piece of property or the whole tree farm out here, it's up for sale. And um, I've just been kind of, uh, it's been up for sale for maybe a year and a half now. Um, haven't made a lot of plans, future plans for it, because I don't know what, what the future really holds before making that kind of investment. It's a good question, though. It'd be a good use. Chris, uh Afternoon, Brian Pugh. Uh, first, I want to thank you for bringing us here. And I know when I sat in your office a couple months ago and said, Shannon's a great manager, you got hundreds of thousands of acres, a great tree farm, and we want to bring to the board the spot that looks like a failure. And uh, without hesitation, you knew what I was asking, and, and I appreciate you bringing us here because we could be standing on many, many acres in Eastern Oregon that look like this. Right. And the bootleg fire down in Lakeview this year, uh, the Berry Point fire before that, other fires across that are less known are like this. And other landowners, small private landowners that maybe aren't even in this forestry, but they have trees, don't have the resources. They don't have nursery space at all or don't have anything. So I think we'll get into a little bit of that in the next speakers. What I wanted to kind of just set the stage, it's after lunch for a little bit, but this fire was 2014 in June. Um, some pretty famous pictures of the wedding that was happening at the golf course too, that, that went around the world that were beautiful. How close... I got lost on the way out here, but how close are we from the fire edge to going into town? And you may not be the one to know this, but somebody here does, I know. Yeah, so it, it basically hung up, it hung up in the old, uh, well, it, it hung up just above Tumlow Creek, and it was just about, it was throwing spots on a private property. 
we had luckily treated that entire area around that private property so we had we had thinned and burned around that private property so it was throwing embers onto it and dying but it, it died out right at the right at the top of tumlo creek canyon you probably have the answer to the next question i'm going to too um so you mentioned you know possible land use change i know you kind of say that in jest but you never know it's for sale also the idea that it was almost taken out condos and in, in there and then this was two bulls last year it was bull springs that fire was somewhere around here and wasn't that fire in april Yeah, You're close. It, it, it was almost a April Fool's joke, but that 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 was um, private land burning piles, wind event, and and just happened to be at that dry time of year. So two hundred ish acres. I can't remember exactly. Two hundred. There you go. So again, thank you for having us out here, and and for the group, the idea that. Not necessarily an uncommon spring event to have fires out here no. close to Bend and, and not on the National Forest, but on private lands and coming in and, and the threat's real, so. So this is a question for the, the East Side silviculturists and, and, and Chris, maybe maybe you're it. I'm, I'm maybe looking a little bit to Joe as well, but is it is it, getting trees grown back here, is that just a cost prohibitive issue or is it just – not going to happen like what 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 are the obviously uh uh you know deficient in water but is there a way to make it work or is it just not possible um it certainly is possible and it has been done many times um for us typically most of our fires occur at the lower mid elevations the driest sites that we have and um it's the inputs that it takes to try to ensure their survival that make it so tough. Um, we would have to tube the trees with Vexar tubing or some kind of way to keep game from uh, browsing it, and then perhaps some fertilizer treatment, and then uh, veg management, uh, spray it, get rid of the vegetation. So you start to put all those costs together, and at that point it's extremely costly for um, – uh, reforestation that may or may not take effect so it's been my experience so I, I don't want to cut short um, a good conversation that's started here but I know we've got a couple more speakers um, that might actually uh, further the conversation and then we can return to questions so I don't know who's up next Josh but afternoon my name is chase duncan i am one of the local stewardship foresters here and currently uh starting a rotation as a wildland fire supervisor for central oregon district and just ending a rotation as the assistant to the eastern oregon area director focusing on reforestation and recovery for klamath and lake counties um <laughs> I'm glad Chris went first. He talked about a lot of the same things. The, uh, you know, you've heard bootleg be talked about a lot and everybody remembers it. Uh, that was a big part of what I've been working on the last six months. And I think it's, to put it into perspective, uh, the fire, large fires in Klamath and Lake counties from 2020 and 2021, when you combine the acreage are just slightly larger than all of Benton County. And I think that puts, uh, puts a big picture in my mind, at least. But the, uh, you know, Chris was mentioning the the salvage. So as stewardship foresters, that's our first uh, assistance to landowners is trying to work them through the salvage and help them out. For a lot of the small non-industrial landowners, uh, that little bit of margin Chris was talking about just isn't possible um, between the distance to mills, the size of their property, they just can't make it work. And uh, so then we go to the reforestation, and luckily the non-industrial landowners can take part in the EFRP program. It's the, I oh, hope I don't butcher it, Emergency Forest Restoration Program. And uh, that helps them out with costs to 
vegetation management and seedlings and is, is a big asset to them. Uh, as we get into that program, the big hurdle, which you've already heard multiple times between yesterday and today, is seedlings and seed. A lot of central and eastern Oregon, since we uh, don't reforest very often, is that seed bank isn't there. And so uh, another, put into perspective, the 242 fire was a Labor Day fire 2020 on 97 down in Klamath County. Uh, EFRP landowners alone need a half a million seedlings to reforest. And just this year we got the first 100,000 seed purchased and sown to go into uh, hopefully seedlings into the ground next year. Uh, so definitely a big hurdle to get over there. The uh, We are working on it. Uh, I don't, when we get into this topic, it always sounds like doom and gloom and there's no, no at the end of the tunnel. But, uh, you know, our, our partners with the Forest Service, the NRCS, and NGOs, we're working on getting seed and having the uh, potential co-op orchards. And there are things going in motion to try to, combat that going forward um but yeah seed and nursery space is uh hard to come by and then hard to keep them growing once they're in the ground and uh yeah i i i think that's the majority of what i want to talk about <laughs> pass it off to nate and then uh, i think have time for questions Hey, good afternoon. My name is Nate Agelsoff, and I'm the Family Forest Land Coordinator uh, in the Incentives Unit at ODF Salem. Uh, the, the, just real quick, the Incentives Unit serves to support a variety of efforts, and we work in different programs, but I would say that it's all under the umbrella of things landowner assistance. And so many of the programs that we work with are aimed at alleviating some of the financial impacts that are associated with proactive management on uh, non-industrial family forest lands. And so a significant part of, of this work then is also post-fire uh, recovery and restoration projects. Um, <clears throat> you know, Josh mentioned it here. Um, it's an important piece, the, the collective understanding that uh, Restoration is a many-year process, and um, we work with, with a variety of agency partners in the land and the community and, and others to, to help them understand that. And the other thing that uh, I've come to understand is, uh, you know, we think a lot about, you know, how to get people engaged. Uh, so there's a, a pretty significant outreach component. But uh, there is also um, an education and planning aspect uh, to large scale restoration projects and and I feel that that really underscores the the value of restoration being a very collaborative process and yeah uh, Chase and uh, Chris talked a little bit about this and the you know the things you need following a fire can often be different uh, depending on where you're at and uh, you know the resource concerns the priorities may vary as do the the landowner goals and objectives and and so we heard about the, the seed and seedling thing. Um, so thinking about some of the west side fire footprints that we had in 2020, uh, I you know, generally say we're in an okay place with seed supply in those, in those footprints. And um, you know, some eastern landscapes, not, not so much the case. Um, you know, salvage logging might be another good example where, where it can vary, uh, you know, maybe by species, size, where uh, location um, and make the difference between a profitable operation and whether or not it seems like a viable option. And and I mentioned also landowner priorities, and so I think it's important to recognize that um, there's some differences in what we consider the primary use of land. Um, you know how timber is viewed as you know as an investment or aesthetic, and um, and also a, a property owner's. Uh, ability and readiness to engage in restoration activities. 
And so the department's uh, collaboration and maintaining of relationships with, with local organizations um, also add value to the fire-affected landowner. And, and so those agency partners, they might assist with, with our outreach or um, provide input on assessments and identifying priorities. But um, also, you know, they net uh, greater engagement and participation in our programs. And um, I would say that that's, that's really additive to the services that ODF provides. And um, you know, Chase touched on uh, some of the, the ODF Forester uh, roles and responsibilities. And um, I, just real briefly, I'll touch on two uh, as it relates to restoration work. And first is administration of the Forest Practices Act. And second would be the technical assistance for implementing federal programs. And, um, and to the, the point around the forest practices piece, I'd say, and how it relates to um, our federal programs that we deliver, is we have some tools available in the FPA, such as uh, plan for alternate practice and the suspension of uh, the reforestation rules that allow access to those programs, and, and um, pretty valuable to have that flexibility. Uh, Chase mentioned also the um, Emergency Forest Restoration Program, and I'll mention that just real briefly. And that's that's a program that we work with the uh, Farm Services Agency on, and um, that's been a primary tool historically. And I would say the reason why for that is is it's um, it's remained our, one of our most viable options to secure a very large amount of funding, and and do that in a very reactive way. And um, in addition to the traditional assistance programs that we deliver, um, I'll mention the, the uh, appropriation that we received through House Bill 5006. And the department here is, is making um, some investments with two primary program objectives in mind with that. And that's uh, first to increase the, the um, availability and access uh, of seedlings for uh, small forest landowners. And the second is to um, increase the supply and capacity of, of forest nurseries. And um, I'll, I'll just kind of wrap up here with um, mentioning a couple of uh, uh, forward-thinking endeavors that, that at least I'm aware of. And uh, I would say in the um, spirit of partnership, I, uh, I like where it's going uh, between the, the ODF and the NRCS to p pilot, a, as soon as this fire season, a um, post-wildfire response team, I, uh, they're still playing with the acronym, I think, but it'll be very similar to uh, the, the bear team concept with the, the Forest Service, you know, uh, subject matter experts, and and um, basically the at the end state will be generating some, uh, a report that, that will enable the, the local management to, uh, on both sides to better respond both budgetarily and, and ecologically. And, um, and last, uh, I'll close with the um, the department's uh, work, uh, we've um, built on some of the work that American Forests um, are tapping into, some of the work that American Forests has already taken on, and um, we're going to be working with them to develop the reforestation strategy for Oregon. And that'll be just uh, a, a near-term part, or two parts, near-term, which will be the, a statewide assessment of all aspects of the reforestation pipeline, speaking to current resources, capabilities, alternatives and constraints from, from seed to planting. And, and the second uh, half of that is, is to be a, a regional analysis to explore um, you know, some climate, climate smart opportunities, um, such as you know, uh, assisted migration, alternate species planting, afforestation, um, various alternatives. So at this point, I'll, I think I turn it over to Josh here. And yeah. All right, great. Thank you, Nate. Um, now uh, we can turn it over for questions for any of our speakers. Uh, Chris, when I'm asking a question, it feels like I'm digging at an open wound here. Um, but, you know, listening to all of this, and it, it's obviously that this land is not making any sense under private ownership from what you've described and I'm just wondering um, is there an opportunity here given the proximity to the hundred thousand people that this 
could uh, be turned into a, a community forest where you were taking advantage of volunteers and public um, money and involvement over many, many years. Because what I heard is it's really, really difficult um, and costly, but not impossible Correct. for this to, to happen. And when I, when I hear that, it's making no private sense and given the proximity. Um, just asking that question, and I think that's a question for you and, and uh, also our commissioner here to, to comment. Sure, uh, it's a great question. It's a great idea. Um, certainly not a, opposed to doing more work out here. Um, it just, unfortunately, uh, good, better, and different boils down to dollars and cents and what makes economic sense. Um, given that this property is up for sale, there's been all kinds of people and organizations that have looked at it some qualified, some sophisticated, others not. Um, and perhaps it would, uh, a conservation outfit would buy it. And um, I'm sure they would utilize it for recreational opportunities. And they have a, a very different set of objectives. And um, I could see, probably naive of me to think this, but that they'd be able to maybe put something together to get more um, reforestation work done out here. No, it's, it's a really good question. And I, I, would, I would just add that um, the idea of, of creating a community forest out here, acquiring this, this, this piece of Shanda's holdings, which is you know, way bigger than um, this Bull Springs tree farm uh, uh, property, um, that, that idea was put forward Ten years ago? Oh, at least. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, 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 a good a good chunk of time ago, and the the county at the time uh, indicated a willingness to to back that concept of creating a community forest with the, the county's bonding authority, um, and it, I, that that deal didn't quite come together. Um, I. I the, the the kind of in initial asking price now is substantially larger than than um, than it was back at that point in time. I, I you know as I, I I'm a one of three county commissioners, but I would be willing to to vote in support of of you know uh, doing that kind of bonding again. I just don't know whether we're anywhere near the ballpark of being able to to to. Um, Get to the needed price that to 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 make it uh, worthwhile for the the owner. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, I'm going to get a little bit to Seth's question about is it possible, and 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 it is. And Chris is right; it is possible to reforest sites like this. Um, my company, we burned about 6,000 acres in the Cornette Windy Fire south of Baker City, very similar site uh, productivity class to this. And it takes very, very aggressive vegetation control to make trees grow here, you know, very aggressive. Um, you know, that, that's really the key to, to uh, amongst other things that Chris mentioned, but it's really aggressive vegetation control. I think one very big difference in Northeast Oregon, the advantage of the land base uh, I have the honor to manage is I still have mill infrastructure and competitive a competitive log market, um, so we were able to capture more value than unfortunately Chris could do, and and I, I think that that's the that's the unfortunate nature you know over here in Central Oregon is that shallowness of that you know one one mill, I mean he was very very blatant. I I, I tend not to talk about my friendly log buyers the way Chris does, <laughs> they're they're my good friends. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but that that competitive situation where you know Northeast Oregon is fragile also, but not like here. Uh, we we still have competition, which allows us to to generate more revenue, which then, and Chris alluded to it, can you know allows you to 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 to, to you know spend the money to have to have success. You know, you're probably looking at you know three or three or four hundred dollars an acre. You know, in that kind of world. You know, to the kind of edge control that you have to do here to, to be successful along the reforestation, I would guess. Okay, any more questions? Oh, sorry. I didn't know if anyone else did. 
Um, so talked about reforestation and um, you know in COP26 and you know in the in the big dialogue of climate change and carbon. You know, uh, it just seems that the one of the big pieces is uh, regrowth of uh, forest seedlings, reforestation. So it just seems I I heard two different sides of the um, of the of the uh, of the issue. One is it's really difficult, but also just recently that there are things with American forests that are going on. And my just thought is, you know, it is just, um, you know, a big anchor into the carbon um, cycle. And um, we've done it before. I mean, you know, I'm old enough to know that, you know, when J. Herbert Stone and the Ben Nursery and all this was just a huge, big production. So we know the process, and we know the patterns, and you know how to do it. So, um, you know, uh, I guess it's it's just I'm just trying to figure out how big a haul of it, and how close are we? Because that's we know that we need to do that. That's an important part of this whole climate change and carbon piece. Um, are we more optimistic than not, just because we've been able to do it before and we know how to do it? Uh-oh, Ed has the microphone. I'm Ed Brown. Um, I'm with the Central Oregon Forest Stewardship Foundation. I'm on the board. I retired from the Fremont Wynema as the forest silviculturist. And um, every year you do a seed inventory. You look at your seed inventory. And on the Fremont Wynema, we figured we had enough seed for 20,000 acres of reforestation of Pondo. Well, bootleg's going to kind of blow that out of the water when you look at the size of that. And we also tried to get tree climbers to come collect cones for white bark, because we the Fremont has some of the best white bark in the world since it might get listed. We couldn't find any contractors. So this goes into the workforce. We've got it following up on what you're saying. Wind River is gone. P ben Pine Nursery is gone. And I th if the board and I know Holly, you guys got to push for this because 242 they were told they couldn't reforest it because they didn't want to spend the money. I know that for a fact. So there's some real problems that people don't understand that you need to have. The seed orchards are almost ready to start producing through the Forest Service. It's been 30, 40 years of building those. A lot of them got burned up. Um, but we've got to look at this because you can dream about reforestation, but if you don't have seed, an American forest is working with the Fremont Wynema, but where is the seed going to come from? That's what I ask. So these are really serious questions. You almost have to rebuild the infrastructure again. So, um, and honestly, I look at what's going on in bootleg, and we've been watching this drought move up from California, and it was predicted that we'd probably get really dry. And just look at your snowpack. I think a lot of these places are going to stay like this. I don't care how much work you put into it. Um, the Yakult burn in Washington still has no trees on it, 1902. So, and I, my first fire was here. It was Bridge Creek. I don't see a whole lot of trees in Bridge Creek. That was 40-something years ago. So I think we have to assess it, and that's what American Forest wants to do. They're looking at it. Can we actually grow a tree here? Plus, we have this complete change in the weather patterns. So not being pessimistic, I think you can do it, but you can't do it the way we used to. It's going to take – we've got to build that infrastructure again. That's going to take time to get seed. It's hard to find seed right now. So um, just not pessimistic, but realistic. So – yeah, I think to follow up on that, um, you know, we're working to navigate those challenges uh, that you raise. Um, and we do that um, through our stewardship forces on a site-by-site -site basis right now. So uh, there was talk of the bootleg fire and things like that. Um, Joe mentioned the Cornette Windy. And so we've moved through uh, places like that, I think, um, as I think about it, back to the Berry Point fire. So we've kind of, over time, worked through those various events and kind of learned through those in our Stewardship foresters work to make sure when we're working with landowners on the landscape that we're not requiring reforestation that's probably not going to be successful given our current climate. So, you know, from that starting point, um, there is a shortage of seed that does exist. When we have fires on the east side, um, we do have what's called the Oregon Seed Bank. Um, but what how it functions is it works in, um, it is it has access to seed from our J.E. Schroeder Seed Orchard which is made up of uh, mostly industrial cooperators. 
So where those folks operate, we have um, seed that's available to small forest landowners. But in places like Eastern Oregon, um, as Chris mentioned, they don't do even age forestry um, in a lot of places. So they didn't have a need for seed. So there's not that um, bank built up to draw from when these fires occur. Um, but there are ongoing discussions right now um, based on those fires out towards Baker City and following bootleg, the need to, to build that up, whether that's from actual seed orchards or those may need to come from wild collections, but um, building that up and trying to keep that on hand. So that is that is a recognized need and that is that is a little bit new, I think, in probably the last 10 or so years um, with the fires occurring like that and that significant need for um, reforestation. Uh, uh, Amanda Sullivan Astor for the record again with Associated Oregon Loggers. So um, kind of to Ed's point on, on the workforce piece specifically around reforestation and tree climbers, you know, and even just the broader workforce, you know, we've been talking about workforce all day and capacity. And I think, I think part of what, what AOL is trying to do, and I put this back on the board and ODF, is, um, you know, these, these are hard jobs. Um, they're dangerous jobs. And uh, the state has devalued them. Um, and so people don't want to go into them anymore. Um, I would say that's true for a lot of trades, um, but specifically there's, there's a lot of um, uh, strong opinions about the, the workforce that works in the woods. And so I think we have a really, really great opportunity in the revision for the FPFO and the 20 year plan to, to create that social license to do more in the woods, talk about the work that we do in the woods more holistically, like, uh, like Liz was talking about, the cycle, um, not just of uh, what we do, but the cycle of, of trees, the cycle of, of carbon, and, and how do we really um, address that through, uh, through these documents. So just wanted to, to touch on that really quick, and, and again, kind of put that back on, on the board and, and the board's work and, and the department to, to kind of help the industry tell that story as well, uh, and the folks that are out there working. So I did have a, a question for Chris, though. Um, so related to this specific piece of ground, um, as we think about the FPFO and climate change, we think about post-fire uh, restoration and, and salvage. Um, so, so obviously you guys salvaged this piece of ground, got what you could to try to help uh, subsidize the reforestation costs. Fortunately, the reforestation effort has been uh, relatively unsuccessful here. Um, but I guess, I guess what I want to kind of ask is, you know, what, what would have been the alternative, right? We would have not salvaged. I don't know how um, severe the fire was. I'm guessing fairly severe based on uh, the, the remnants we have out here. So thinking about post-fire disturb, you know, post-fire restoration from a climate change perspective, right? Although that wood that you were able to, to harvest then went into long-lived uh, wood products that are maintaining that storage of carbon. So, I mean, as, as, as a landowner, when you guys are trying to decide what to do with, with the piece of ground, um, d does that come into, into your mind at all? And, and, and how, like, what would you tell the board as we think about climate change and the FPFO and, and really trying to create this new rhetoric around climate smart forestry when it comes to post-fire restoration? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think as I stated earlier, uh, we were able to salvage about 10 or 12 million feet out of the fire. Um, and like I said, at that time, we had to make that decision. And part of that was, is like I said, I'm not going to turn my back on 12 million feet of standing dead timber. Um, one, I think it would be, in my view, just an ecological disaster to leave that. It's going to just rot, emit carbon anyway. And it's just going to be a fire hazard down the road for many years to come. Um, so <clears throat> that's why we made the decision to do what we did. Um, we took our losses and tried to do the best we could with what we had. Um, there's not many things in this world I hate, but I do hate waste. And I hate to see that amount of timber just standing dead and rotting and not serving a good purpose. Um, in 2010, north of here, there was a rooster rock fire. Um, I was not on the tree farm at that time. I was doing some different work, contract work. But um, the forester at that time lost, I think, the company ground, say it was about 1,000, 1,500 acres. He made the decision to um, not do anything. He just left it because he knew the likelihood of 
reforestation success was just too low to take that risk to do it. And now every year I get to go through and clear those roads with a chainsaw because the crap falls on it all the time and it's just a mess. And um, so I'd rather do something than nothing, right? Uh, carbon wise and otherwise. So, yep. Don't worry, Josh, I won't put you on the spot. I see that smile. Uh, more of an editorial comment. So, following up from the question at lunch, this is kind of the paradigm shift. This is the third leg of the stool of restoration and recovery. And so we heard this morning at the first stop from Chief Shaw that we can't suppress our way out of fires. They're, they're going to happen. And I think at the second and third stops, we realized that the pace and scale is never going to be big enough to really get ahead of all the fuels mitigation work that we want to do. And so we all know that fire seasons are longer, more intense, and more acres are burned. And so these are the results we have. So we got Nate and his group and Chase as a stewardship forester kind of ramping up that landowner assistance and doing that. But again, back to bootleg as an example, uh, I'm not always great on details, so don't quote me, but about 500,000 acres, about 100,000 acres of private, okay. A lot of that was Green Diamond, okay. About 20,000 acres of small industrial private. These numbers I do have right because Chase just told me. There was 1,500 landowners. 700 of those were absentee landowners. So how does a stewardship forester or two reach out to them? Sure, some of those 700 landowners probably never even saw their property, that they bought it absentee. But how do they reach out to them and say, you know, you may want to salvage – you're probably not going to make any money on that, but we want you to grow trees back, and we're here to help you. That just takes a lot of time. I mean, you all know about engaging landowners and talking to communities and stuff, but when you're getting fires that have 1,500 landowners, and we as Oregonians want to have healthy forest, we've got to make those connections and do that work. So I see the paradigm for the department as ramping up in this side of the house, in this forest restoration. And Liz is absolutely right. We have did it before on the planting and the reforestation and the seed collection when the logging was heavy on the east side in the 80s and 90s. That infrastructure is gone now, but potentially has to come back with the help of the Forest Service, with the help of private industrial lands as cooperative effort. So the seed is available so we can have the nursery space so those landowners that have five or ten acres can buy it. And whether they salvage or not, have seedlings and have funding to replant. And so as we go today, I think we you know go through the day. I think we're very good on the response and people get that. We're really coming together on the fuels treatment. But this is the side of the house. And it is these questions about climate change and changing uh, – uses of land and all that that we've got to think through so there is no one easy answer of well we just plant trees everywhere i don't know that that's the answer yet either but we got to think through that so we are after the labor day fires you know the department has more money and more funding and more people but probably not to the scale that we need to be given the fire regimes right now that was a long question Um, coming back to this this piece of land here, which you guys picked the doozy to take us to, and this is real stark. <laughs> um, um, I'm guessing you planted Ponderosa. Um, going off of what Nate was saying about you know thinking about alternative seed sources, assisted migration, is there another species that might make sense here, given the site and the climate future? <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> um, I mean, I figured that was probably the answer, but I wanted to ask. Yeah. We had time. Uh, 
sort of going back to an earlier topic, but while while we have Chris here, um, there was uh, Chris, there was a um, a question about those Senate Bill seven sixty two landscape resiliency funds and what uh, what work those were those funds would be going into across this this you know huge landscape in in Central Oregon. And I, I believe that you're uh, that that Chanda some some portion of the Bull Springs tree farm is part of that project, and I was hoping you could just um, get to pull us back from post fire recovery and and talk a little bit about uh, fuels work that you're planning on doing. Yeah, that's a that's a nice positive note. Um, We've never uh, been, we've applied for a number of grants over the years, many years, never been successful, but this time around, we were successful. And uh, I put in a number of proposals. Uh, we had to do it quickly, had to throw together stuff kind of uh, by the seat of our pants. But uh, for, like I said, for the first time in my career, uh, we actually got money. And then I kicked myself, I should have asked for more. So... But one of the projects that we did get funded was uh, we've got 1,300 acres out here, uh, just east of here, lower elevation, um, getting uh, rid of juniper, um, cutting uh, small diameter pine, and uh, doing some mowing. Um, it'll be a, a great uh, resiliency project. Um, it's in an area that uh, sees a lot of traffic um, and uh, that's a it's a wonderful thing to be able to do. Um, it's the age old thing. Wish we could do more of it, but it's been you know there are just on this tree farm as in any other landscapes we got a lot of warts, and um, I need more medicine, and that's a project that uh, I've been wanting to do for a long long time, just never been able to afford it, and um, I don't want to sound like I'm belly aching, but we run on very thin margins. And um, the money just really isn't there, as I'd like to see to, I try to put as much back in the ground as I can. Um, but there's just not much left over to do that. I'd like to. But uh, it's a nice shot in the arm. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity, and uh, I'd like to see it continue. But, yep, so we got good things coming. We do. So. I got one more question for you, Chris. Yep. Um, thanks, Commissioner, for, for starting that train of thought um theoretically if you had gotten a grant 10 15 years ago and had treated these 6,000 acres how would that have looked different after the fire i know that's a old, very open-ended question but sure it's a good question um we had done um over the years um a lot of work out here you know scattered throughout the area that burned um Yes, it certainly would have helped mitigate some of the worst of it. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, how much that would have been is, is anyone's guess. It certainly would have been helpful. I can say that much. And I guess I have one follow-up. Um, adding fuels mitigation into the mix, we hear that mostly on public forests, federal forests. From a commercial forestry, private commercial forestry perspective, is that profitable? I mean, let's say you get grant funding to do the rest, the, the fuels mitigation work. Can the resulting stand still generate revenue? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just an investment in the, the stock that remains growing. So, yes, it's, it's, it's money well spent. Um, and especially in marginal areas where productivity is really low, you know, you're not going to invest hundreds of dollars per acre in hand thinning on something that barely grows, right? You'll put that money in your higher sites. So those lands, though, like I said, lower elevation, typically see a lot of public use, that kind of thing, a uh, lot of ignition sources. It's excellent to be able to treat some of that. So, yeah. So we do sell about five. Uh, that segment, if there is one last question anywhere, it's getting cold out here. All right, I'm not gonna give the long, uncomfortable pause, considering that it is getting cold out here. 
Uh, so we have also reserved about 30 minutes or so um, on the agenda here at the end of the day for some wrap-up. We started the day uh, looking at the evolution of coordinated response, wildfire suppression. We spent a big chunk of time in the middle of the day uh, talking about really an evolving and growing story uh, around the toolbox and the investments that we're all making into uh, mitigation. And here at the last stop, um, thinking about the need for future investment and restoration. Um, so that's kind of the journey that I think we've been on. And I just want to open things up to the board uh, to see if any of you would like to make some, some closing comments here before we adjourn for the day. Just to put you guys on the spot. Sure. Um, Brian, you'll never make it as a therapist, you know. You, you take us up, and show us all these great things, and then just depress the hell out of us at the end of the day. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I, you know, I do want to reflect back. I've been on the Board of Forestry for um, almost four years, and, um, and when I came on, I was under the understanding that the board regularly did tours, and then we um, also did... Uh, off-site meetings out of Salem uh, at least once a year and I got feeling after a while that there was a lot of lip service around that but the, but there wasn't much commitment to it and so I was very frustrated that we weren't getting out in the woods and doing these kinds of things and getting out into other communities and and I uh, kept pushing can't we change this can't we change it then COVID you know so whoopee so that put an end to all of that even having meetings together and uh, and then we got to the point uh, here almost a year ago, and uh, I become chair, and it looks like COVID is is uh, backing off, and I'm just so excited that we can do team buildings and get out of Salem and do these tours. And uh, you know what's uh, what happened, of course, is that we planned and canceled and planned and canceled. So I'm really thrilled that everybody has uh, pulled this off um, and, and the commitment to do this is, it is a ton of work for Hillary and her crew and for all of ODF. So congratulations to all of you for, for doing this. Um, it, it means a lot. To, uh, I think it means a lot to the board and uh, uh, hopefully means a lot to, to all of you and to all of the other people who have participated uh, and to this community. So um, happy we got this done. So I think that was probably a pretty good uh, wrap up. Maybe we'll just call call it there considering uh, unless somebody was pointing around. Nope. Okay. All right. Well, uh, again, thank you all very much uh, for participating today. I hope you'll take advantage of one of the six outhouses that were brought to this site for the tour before we depart. <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah, we do. Um, let's see. I totally lost my train of thought there. Oh, uh, I do. Uh, I just really want to echo uh, what Chair Kelly said and, and really thank the logistics crew. Um, I'm not going to try to name everybody because I know I'll miss half of them. A lot of folks were involved in uh, making all of this happen today. You've seen some of them here. Some of them have been behind the scenes, but really appreciate that effort as well as in the uh, engagement that you all have given to make some really great uh, conversation today. We, we filled out the agenda well, so thank you.